I'll wait and see. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Dean Moots. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Jay Moots. I'm pleased to welcome all of you here for our annual Pacific Law Review Symposium. Uh, I want to begin with some words of thanks for our Dean Michael Hunter Schwartz and our Associate Dean Rachel Salcido, who support this and other intellectual activities on campus. Special shout out to Mary Beth Moylan, who's manning the door in the back. Who's all the best. Associate Dean Moylan. And we uh, also have sponsorship by the Center for Adjudication and Dispute Resolution, along with the Pacific Law Review. Finally, Cassandra Fernandez and the IT team have done a great job getting us set up, so let's give them a hand. The provocation for this symposium is Professor Michael Patello's book, Animating Civil Procedure, published in 2017 by the Carolina Academic Press. Mike does a masterful job of demonstrating that the jurisprudence of civil procedure is critically important for ensuring justice and that the legacy of the past decades has been to sharply curtail access to the courts. Mike skillfully animates civil procedure, bringing the cases and disputes alive to issue a heartfelt warning about the state of our legal system. For example, in summarizing the personal jurisdiction rules, Mike writes, Students who read these cases for their abstract principles are missing the dynamic conflict behind the abstract principles. A great deal is at stake. A person may have a host of substantive rights, but absent a convenient forum, those rights are meaningless. A few news and few newspapers will place such decisions on the front page. Few readers will be up in arms calling for reforms. Our goal today is to explore, challenge, and elaborate on Mike's themes and the symposium title says it all. Has the courthouse door been blocked by interpretation of the rules of civil procedure in the context of recent changes in litigation? We'll first hear from my friend and colleague, Mike Vitello, who will provide opening remarks, and then those remarks will be assessed, I don't know what her remarks will be, so I'll just say assessed, uh, by Professor Linda Mullinex at the University of Texas Law School, and I'd like to briefly introduce both of them to you. Distinguished Professor of Law Michael Vitello is a nationally recognized expert on criminal law, sentencing policy, and marijuana law. His work on California's three strikes law has been cited by the United States Supreme Court and the California Supreme Court. He is a member of the American Law Institute, author of 11 books, and author of more than 50 law review articles. During his career, he's taught over 15 different courses with a special emphasis on criminal law, criminal procedure, and civil procedure, and he is currently finishing up work on a new casebook on the topic of marijuana law, which will be published at the end of this year. Our next speaker will be Linda S. Mullinex, who is the Rita and Morris Atlas Chair in Advocacy at the University of Texas Law School. She holds a Master's of Philosophy and PhD from Columbia University in Political Science and graduated Phi Beta Kappa Magna Cum Laude from the City College of New York. She received her law degree from Georgetown University Law Center and practiced appellate litigation in Washington, D.C. She's held appointments as a Supreme Court Fellow at the Federal Judicial Center, scored a gig as scholar in residence at the Rockefeller Foundation Bellagio Study Group, and also held the Fulbright Senior Distinguished Chair in Law in Trento, Italy, She's been a professor since 1974, teaching federal civil procedure, mass court litigation, current issues in class action litigation, and state class action procedure. We're going to begin with Mike Vitello. Thank you, Jay. Uh, first, a quick word of thanks and a bit of an explanation. Thank you, Mary Beth. It was her idea to do this symposium. It was not my idea. A couple of law review editors thought that somehow I had proposed it. People who think that don't know me very well. I was the fourth child in a family of aggressive siblings. You did not go out in front and put your ideas out there unless you expected them to be critiqued. And I, so I did not propose this. But I also told Professor Mullinex that my students would probably really enjoy her critique of my work. I'll just leave it there. <laughs> but let me go to my central thesis. The right wing of the court is using procedure to close the courthouse door. The public reacts to substantive decisions. 
You can see it all the time. The court decides an abortion rights case, gun rights cases, same-sex marriage cases. The public pushes back. The public understands what's going on in those cases. On the other hand, when the court uses procedure to close the courthouse door, there's almost no reaction. <clears throat> now, what's at stake? I think what's at stake in what the uh, right wing of the court is doing is really to erode the rule of law, something that we are rightly proud of in the United States. But I'm, I'm truly fearful for the rule of law. The rule of law, in, for example, in rule number one in the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure states that we need a set of rules that advance the just, speedy, and inexpensive determination of every action and proceeding. Now, by the way, if you doubt me about the importance of procedure vis-a-vis -vis substantive rights, think about the Russian Constitution. The Russian Constitution is filled with a panoply of individual rights, including the right to assemble. But if you were in Russia, you would be very hesitant to organize a, a rally to oppose President Putin. You simply would not do it. Now, also, to make my point about substance versus procedure, how many of you going home at Thanksgiving? You've got an assignment. A quick show of hands. How many of you going? Now, in your families, how many of you will have people on both sides of the political divide? OK, good. You've got an assignment. And for my students, I'll be, uh, well, actually, after Thanksgiving, you'll be free of me, so it'll be, uh, you won't have to respond. What I want you to do is, I want you to sit at the dining room table, and what I want you to do is to say, you know, what do you think, folks, about diversity? Uh, diversity, for example, racial diversity, sexual orientation, uh, affirmative action, issues like that. Then take a temper, yeah, of course not. Uh, take, uh, take a temperature reading in the room. See how long the conversation goes on. See what level of anger you produce. <laughs> then, after that's over, what I want you to do is to talk about a bill that's working its way through the Hopper, H.R. 3487. It's a bill that would expand federal court jurisdiction to minimal diversity cases, and importantly, from my perspective, would allow removal from state to federal court based on minimal diversity. Now, see what the tone is, see what the temperature is in the room. I think you'd probably be fairly confident that you could get away without a big heated discussion. <laughs> All right, then why do you think Representative Steve King, the darling of the Tea Party, a far-right member of Congress, is pushing this bill, especially the part about removal? Who sits on the federal bench today? One of the things that President Trump has announced is that his legacy is going to be reshaping the judiciary, and that there will be a young judiciary that will be with us for many, many years. Defendants like federal court today, and a bill like H.R. 3487 increases the demand for federal litigation. If the docket increases too much, will the next call be for an expanded federal judiciary? with new appointments by President Trump. A little bill, like 3487, that will not get the pulse of your family raised very much at all, could have a profound effect on the federal judiciary for years. Let me go to three broad themes from the book. Uh, first, Professor Freer, for my students, this is Professor Freer. You've heard about him quite often. I told him to bring a felt tip pen in case any of you wants, wants an autograph of the book. Uh, I also told him that you might ask him about the food fight. Uh, but he's going to talk a lot more about personal jurisdiction and the, and the court's recent personal jurisdiction cases. But what I want to do is just mention personal jurisdiction very briefly. In the modern world, would you expect that, that we would have more interstate and international disputes than in the past? given, obviously, the modern economy, modern communication, the internet, and the like. Now, would you expect the court to read the due process clause more broadly to allow the assertion of jurisdiction in increasing number of cases in light of the expanded realities of the way in which we do business today? Of course you would. 
look back 100 years ago, and what you would see was that the Supreme Court during the beginning of the 20th century, when roads were just developing, when trucks would be able to drive at 15 miles an hour, and we were starting to expand commerce, of course the Supreme Court expanded personal jurisdiction. My students, some of them love the Hess case, as silly as it is, because it helped expand personal jurisdiction. 1945, the Supreme Court decides international should, expanding personal jurisdiction then for a period of about 35 years in light of modern communication, modern transportation. Fast forward to the 21st century. Think about the Bristol-Myers case. Bristol-Myers, corporate, large corporation, one of the biggest pharma companies in the world, doing about almost a billion dollars of sales over a 10-year period of Plavix, substantial workforce in California, and yet in Bristol-Myers, the Supreme Court found, well, it, it didn't have to find in that case, but there was no general jurisdiction, and the court found that out-of-state plaintiffs could not sue, even though counsel for the defendant admitted an oral argument, no inconvenience here. The court has been using personal jurisdiction to narrow the opening in the courthouse door. But I leave that in more detail to my friend, Professor Freer. The two other areas I want to cover. First, pleading. Now, many of you, I think, when you first started my course, I hope it's not true anymore, and you read Rule 882, you probably yawned. <laughs> and yet, there was a profound battle that was going on when the drafters of the federal rules adopted Rule 882. Prior to uh, the adoption of the federal <coughs> approach, the uh, code pleading that had been in place in most states around the country had become arcane. Very high standard. Plaintiffs had to plead not uh, evidentiary facts, not conclusions of law. They had to plead ultimate facts. And that was a very challenging thing to do, and pleadings were read against the pleader. What you don't, what you're not aware of, and, and I certainly was not aware as a student, or as a young lawyer, or as an early uh, civil procedure teacher, was what a profoundly plural, uh, uh, profoundly progressive document the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure are. By the time we got procedural reform, beginning in 1934 with the adoption of the Rules Enabling Act, we were in the uh, Depression, and Charles Clark, dean, and then eventually Second Circuit Judge, primary drafter, that's why the Dear Guardi case is so important, involving access to court. We had this profound change in the way we looked at pleading. All that you're required to do is basically to make a plain statement that shows you have a claim for relief. You don't have to allege facts. You don't have to allege a cause of action. It's supposed to be a door opening. Now, those of you who are civil procedure students will realize that what the court has done in a couple of major decisions is to make it harder for pleaders. The most famous case is the Twombly case, where the baby bells, Ma Bell had been broken up, and the baby bells were given the power to compete in each other's jurisdiction, and they were not competing. Was there a conspiracy to violate antitrust laws? I don't know. The plaintiff alleged that there was a conspiracy. The complaint actually included a fair number of other allegations as well, but the court said that was not enough. Uh, merely alleging a conspiracy under the facts of the case was not enough, and the opinion is filled with talk that make it, makes it sound like we were going back to code pleading. You had to plead ultimate facts, not conclusions of law, conspiracy, conclusion of law. Now, again, in clear violation with the, spirits of the, the spirit of the rules. The net effect of a case like Twombly, the defendant did not even have to answer the complaint. The case is decided on a motion to dismiss. The defense lawyer didn't even have to go to its, client, its clients uh, and say, did you conspire? So that we know whether to deny the complaint. Who is the winner and who is the loser? Well, large corporations, in that case, don't even have to come to bar. 
to prove the conspiracy is almost impossible in a case like that without having access to discovery. Typically, the way in which the rules are designed is very low price of admission, put the other party on notice about the kind of nature of the claim, here an antitrust claim, the underlying facts of the case so that you know how to prepare. And once you're on notice, you move to discovery and we can get substantial justice done. The net effect of a case like Twombly is simply to close the courthouse door. Let me move to another area, and that is discovery. Now, <clears throat> discovery, our discovery rules are unique in the world. They are part of another extremely liberalizing trend, part of the rules of civil procedure, again, that progressive movement. The theory is that you make the <coughs> price of admission quite low, and then parties are able to exchange information. I'm able to ask my opponent, give me anything that's not privileged that can tend to prove my case. Now, that's a radical notion. But what's underlying that notion? Rule number one, we don't want lawyering to be the primary value. We want justice. If you have in your files a smoking gun that shows that your client acted reprehensibly, I ought to be able to discover it, and then we ought to settle the case, or at least then we can go to trial and get justice done. Well, discovery for many years has been somewhat controversial, mostly from the defense side. There are accusations that there are discovery abuses. There are two kinds of discovery of abuses, and I'm oversimplifying, I apologize. Over-discovery, typically what plaintiffs do. Lots and lots of interrogatories because they're expensive to answer, easy to generate. Some of you who've worked in law offices know that you have a little button that will just churn out those interrogatories. <clears throat> but the other side of the coin is evasion. That is, and probably more typically, <coughs> defendants playing bob and weave. That is, uh, if you ask an interrogatory or a question in a deposition, that can be objected to because it's too broad. Then you object that it's too broad. Uh, but then, if you have to narrow the question, then you can technically avoid answering the question. And the art form in discovery is asking the right question. If I'm hiding something behind this black curtain, you don't quite know how to ask the question to figure out what it is. Now, for years there have been allegations that there are discovery abuses. The statistical data don't really support it in most cases. But quite recently, Chief Justice Roberts spoke about the need to do some reform of Rule 26. 26B1, I hope all of my students have a tattoo, remember? <laughs> Scope of discovery, remember the midterm? Okay. <laughs> now, sorry to bring up an unpleasant subject. <laughs> <clears throat> so, <clears throat> in explaining why there was going to be some discovery, some uh, re revision of Rule 26, uh, the Chief Justice cited the fact that there are discovery abuses, and he cited both kinds of discovery abuses. But guess what? Guess what the reforms to Rule 26b1 address? What they do is they move uh, proportionality, which was in the rule anyway, but they move it front and center as a reminder that judges and litigants should object on the grounds of the discovery being requested requested is disproportionate. What kind of discovery abuse is that aimed at? That's over-discovery, the kind that plaintiffs engage in, asking for too much information. So having announced that the court was concerned about discovery abuses, the only reform addresses the evils of the plaintiff's bar, not the kind of evasiveness that takes place often in defendants' cases. And what's at stake? <clears throat> I often cite, well, thankfully, because it's in the casebook I use, uh, the Fison's case, a case involving a young infant whose doctor prescribes a drug manufactured by Fison's. And the drug is toxic, and here we now have an infant who is going to have a lifetime of disability. 
And the performance by the defendants in that case was truly criminal. They engaged in what I tell my students would make Muhammad Ali proud, a bob and weave. There was no way that you were going to be able to discover the information that the defendant had. The issue in the case was whether the drug company was aware uh, of this toxic effect. And it was aware. There was a substantial amount of evidence that the defendant was hiding. I don't know how I speculate. Rich, do you know how that information came over the trans? Uh, trans? I don't. I speculate that some young associate in a large law firm must have felt guilty about it and knew that the partner was engaging in what I imagine was close to criminal right. conduct, right. and then kind of the guilt sort of nails this letter. But the evidence then demonstrates that the, that the drug company was perfectly well aware of this drug's toxic effect, and yet had not changed the protocol for, for uh, prescription of this drug. Evasion. That is a very significant part of what the defense bar engages in when it engages in discovery uh, abuses. And the modern setting, we're not engaged in ways in which we're going to make it harder to engage in evasion. Instead, the only change in the discovery rules is going to make it harder for plaintiffs to engage in discovery. So let me turn to the, the end of my remarks. I don't know if any of you have read the book closely. I, I wrote it in 2016. And at that point, there's a little bit of optimism in some of it. I had to rewrite it because uh, I thought that President Clinton was going to make the appointment to replace Justice Scalia. And so, Occasionally, I noticed in rereading the book to prepare my remarks, I noticed a couple of places where I didn't catch references that seemed to be a little bit uh, optimistic. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and I, my, my central thesis was that the current co the court, prior to Gorsuch and Kavanaugh's appointment, that the court was really the most right-wing court since the court that was in existence at the time of the beginning of the Roosevelt term, that this was the most right-wing court that we faced. And here's the thing that is deeply troubling to me, uh, that we now have these two new appointments. So, if you think about this question, you know, do judges uh, get on the court and think, well, I'm going to decide cases to favor corporations over injured individuals? I think quite often the answer is no. Uh, I had a very dear friend who was largely a, a defense, a very successful defense lawyer, represented corporations. He did uh, employment law, labor law. And he would tell me about all the cheating plaintiffs, that there was no plaintiff in the world that you know, was honorable. They were all trying to steal something from his client. You know, part of that was a kind of mindset that he had. But if I asked him, you know, are you just sort of pro-corporate because you're pro-corporate, he would have said no. He was in a position of deniability. The thing that is deeply troubling to me is that what has happened in over the past decade or more is that there has been a very concerted plan to shift the court to the right. And I don't mean conservative. I don't mean that philosophy of Edmund Burke small government but good government, a sense of obligation to others as well. That's conservatism. It's not the blood flow mediators like Rush Limbaugh who are conservatives. That's not conservatism. But there is a movement now on the far right to really transform the nature of the court. Gorsuch and Kavanaugh are from that far right movement. And there are a number of really well-established doc uh, doctrines in place today dealing with liberal values that have been established over time and norms that have been established over time that really are now in the crosshairs of the court. My fear for the current court is that we're going to see an even further and more dramatic closing of the courthouse door. And so from my perspective, I want to call on all of you young people and to admit that our generation has done a lousy job in giving you a, the current world that we have and I want to alert you to the fact that stay tuned.
Thank you. Um, while Professor Molnix is going up, there are a couple of seats for those of you standing in the back. There are a couple of seats here, here, two down here. So make yourself comfortable for the next. Okay, uh, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I want to thank um, the dean, the associate dean, uh, Professor Moylan, for having the idea to do this, my distinguished colleagues, uh, and Professor Vitiello for writing the book uh, that inspired having this uh, symposium, and of course, distinguished law students. Um, Ordinarily, when I'm in good health, I have a terrible voice, um, but I've been under the weather um, this past week with a cold, and so I sound really, really bad. I sound like the frog queen, <laughs> so I apologize for that. Um, and also, I'm going to see if I have water up here and throat lozenges, so I'm going to see if, if I can get through this. So um, the first thing I want to say is I want to congratulate uh, Professor Vitiano on the book. I absolutely love the book. If you're a procedure nerd, a page everybody here, the, the professors at least are procedure nerds, um, you read this book and you can't but help but love it. Um, and in part it's because he, in the book, he goes through a lot of the cases we teach in first year civil procedure. Um, but he does have an overarching theme uh, in the book, and that's why we're here, and I think we're not just to talk about uh, the doctrine and the cases, but what, what's going on. Um, and so after I read the book, by the way, I think if all of you 1Ls who are taking procedure, you should go buy this book. It's a great enhancement. <laughs> he told us he would not say that. And so we said, well, we'll say it for you. It's a, great, <laughs> it's a great book to read along with what you're doing in procedure because it'll help you understand the cases and what's going on. So anyway, um, so I read the book. And I decided that I wanted to ask myself a question based off what he's doing in the book, which is, uh, is the arc of procedure, uh, is it bending towards injustice? And uh, to answer that question, you have to understand that in addition to talking about these cases, uh, Professor Gutiello is really working on a certain narrative. And it's a narrative that's very, very prevalent uh, throughout the procedural academy nowadays, in all of the law review literature and at every single conference we go to. So what is this narrative? <clears throat> so in order to get to his narrative, we kind of have to know what came before. And also, when I was reading his book, I realized something absolutely profound, which is both Professor Vichel and myself, we went through college in the 1960s, uh, and we went through law school uh, shortly thereafter, um, and those were the uh, original days of revolution, right? Um, and we, our generation, we were the original generation of social justice warriors. Um, uh, because of all the ferment that was going on in the country then. And when we went through law school, it was a very exciting time. Uh, because there was an entire case line uh, dealing with procedural due process. And we were just immersed in that. And we read all of these cases. Um, and they dealt with things like what procedural due process were you entitled to when you were having government benefits taken away from you, okay? And that's represented by a number of the cases. I definitely remember Fuentes versus Sheva. This involved people, poor people, who bought uh, furniture on a horrible installment plan, and they got the link in their payments, and, and the company came in and took out their refrigerator and their stove. Right, the Supreme Court came back and said, no, I can't do that, procedural due process. So this was all very inspiring, right, when we went through law school, right, and it really imbued um, our uh, thinking about what the justice system could accomplish. And then a lot of us after law school went with big corporate law firms. But anyway, <laughs> it was a very exciting time to be in law school, all right? I mean, it does talk about 
before he gets to the narrative that he wants to focus on, he does talk about the progressive era, okay, which goes back uh, in time. But anyway, this is, if you look at this case line, this is the upward arc of procedural justice. And this extended all the way down into the 1990s uh, with Connecticut versus Torr, which dealt with pre-attachment seizure of property and all the requirements are just are required in the state of law. Then we get to his book. All right, and this is the arc of procedural justice, downhill all the way, or a really horrible, <laughs> miserable last decade. All right, and um, this is kind of collecting the cases he's talking about in the book to document, okay, this downward arc, really, really horrible. Um, and so he focuses on different areas of law. All right, so he's got, first of all, the Summary Judgment Trilogy going back to 1986, and he talks about Scott v. Harris, um, and the idea here is this is really terrible. The Supreme Court's sending the message, use summary judgment more often to get rid of cases and off the docket. Uh, and that was 1986, two, uh, 2007. Um, and then, of course, in 2007, 2009, okay, we get uh, Twomley and Iqbal, a horrible, horrible pleading cases, correct? Uh, and 2011 was a banner year, okay, uh, we had uh, two personal jurisdiction cases here that he talks about. Uh, it talks, well, Nicastro is the most horrible one. That's mm -hmm. Mr. Nicastro loses four fingers and he can't recover anywhere. Uh, and then the uh, Goodyear case, which is the accident in Paris, and the parents could not recover for their children because it happened abroad. Um, and then uh, Walmart versus Dukes, okay, the infamous class action decision from the Supreme Court, which basically... Uh, uh, cut the feet out from under all of these women, okay, who were suing uh, for discrimination claims. And then uh, AT&T, which was the first of a series of cases uh, dealing with um, uh, class action waivers, uh, basically in arbitration clauses, which they're going to talk about. Um, and then, let's see, after 2011, uh, American Express versus Tan Colors, again, is another case dealing with arbitration clauses. Uh, Atlantic Marine is kind of a tough case uh, in this downward arc. The only way I can think it's in this downward arc is it's dealing with venue and transfer of venue and form selection clauses. Um, uh, but trying to uh, talk about the law in that area. And then Downler, uh, again, it's another personal jurisdiction case, and that's closing the courthouse doors basically to litigants from Argentina who are trying to recover from uh, the dirty war down there. All right, so that's the downward off. So I'm reading this book, and you can, you can put together that narrative, right? It's, it's definitely, definitely true. But by the time I get to the end, it's like, it's really depressing. <laughs> um, and his theme, this is the theme, closing of the courthouse doors, that's what these uh, cases represent, and it's a denial of access to justice. And again, as I said, by the time I get, it's very depressing. So this is <laughs> Professor Gutiello. Okay. He's, he's the grim reaper of civil procedure. Uh, this is a really terrible narrative. It's very depressing. All right. Now, this is very interesting, okay, because I'm here to give you a different narrative. Uh, and as I think it's funny, because the people who know me, I'm usually the Debbie Downer. <laughs> so, um, there, and one of the times is, let's see if we can find some good in here. All right, so my question is, is there anything good <laughs> happening in procedure land, right, to offer at least perhaps a little counter-narrative? And I have five themes. All right, and what I want to talk to you about is sometimes the Supreme Court gets it right. All right, sometimes the Supreme Court gets it right. Sometimes the court fixes problems, all right, and we should give them credit for that. <clears throat> sometimes the court, over in procedure land, they know their limitations of what they can do. When we talk about the, or the really boring advisory committee on civil rules, bless their hearts. And I think it is good that they're boring, and I'll tell you why I think that. But you should also know that um, when we're talking about procedural justice, it doesn't only come doctrinally from cases from the Supreme Court. And you've talked about the discovery rule. So um, we get our procedure from the rules as well as statutes. We're enacted by Congress. So it's a broader universe of where this procedure comes from. And then my last thing is, no, the sky is not falling. All right, so as I said, it's kind of, um, nothing that Professor Vitiello documents in this book is, is untrue, and I'm not here to deny his narrative. I'm just here to say there is kind of another narrative on that you might think about. 
All right, so the Supreme Court sometimes uh, gets it right. And I know some of my colleagues are going to get upset with some of the things I'm going to have to say. Um, and he, um, Professor Vitiello is mostly talking about stuff that's happened over the last decade. So at least at the beginning here, I'm going to go back into some older cases, but then I'll talk about more recent stuff. All right, um, sometimes the court gets it right, okay? And um, I'm sure you, I don't know if you studied Erie yet. No? No. Okay. Um, well, in Erie Railroad versus Tompkins, okay, the, the Supreme Court did this big reversal of over 100 years of jurisprudence from Swift versus Tyson, and they did us a big favor. It's up here. Um, they basically said there is no general federal common law. They basically said federal judges can't just sit out there freewheeling, you know, and look to the brooding omnipresence to decide what law should apply. Um, and that, that basically was it. And this decision also stands for the proposition that the Supreme Court was trying to end gamesmanship uh, in the way in which litigants were gaming uh, the system by being able to go to another state, reincorporate, and take uh, advantage of federal jurisdiction. So I think they got it right. Now, also, with some of these decisions where I'm going to tell you the Supreme Court got it right, that doesn't mean that they opened up a whole new set of additional horrible problems, right? which is good with the substance procedure divide. But at least they, I think they got this right. Shaver versus Heitner. And again, um, I don't know if you study this, and there's a riff on Professor Tichiello's uh, uh, book on Shaver versus Heitner. What they did in Shaver versus Heitner basically was conflate or collapse in um, all of the inquiries that attach to the personal jurisdiction inquiry. This is obviously after international issue. Um, but it basically eliminated having all this fussing over what is quasi in rem jurisdiction. And when I teach this, by the way, and I do start with Tenoya versus Neff, within the first week of law school, my students are babbling about quasi in rem jurisdiction. And I ask them, tell me what it is. They have no idea. And so after they give me these ridiculous answers about what they think quasi in rem jurisdiction is, I lay down a rule. You're not allowed to use Latin until I say it's okay. <laughs> and it's when we get up to Shaver versus Heidner, it's like, now you can use as much Latin as you want. Okay, and you don't have to talk about quasi in rem jurisdiction. Um, <clears throat> this is going to be really controversial. So even though this is the poster child for horrible decisions from the Supreme Court, I did think they did get something right here that they don't get enough credit for, um, which is in reaching the conclusion they did. They did get rid of and repudiated the no set of facts language and substituted in the plausibility standard. And quite honestly, I don't know, for 30 plus years, all of us were teaching no set of facts standard, and it was very difficult to explain this uh, to our students. And then finally I would tell them, you don't have to worry about it. Everything goes through. It doesn't matter. Right? But the Supreme Court, in the majority opinion, says, you know, it's been highly criticized, and they had a lot of reasons, and they just jettisoned it. Um, I don't know if you're going to read that case and read the dissent by Stevens and Ginsburg. Um, and Ginsburg is the court's proceduralist, and she was really sad about this. And she said, you know, the colleague who gives a no set of facts language kind of deserves a better in, in, interment. Okay? It deserves a better eulogy than what they've done here. All right, and again, this is an example where I think they got rid, bad, rid of a bad standard, but they substituted a more, you know, an equally difficult standard. Shady Grove versus all states. <coughs> oh, you're agreeing with me. This is it from the court in 2010. And here's another place where I thought they got it right. And again, I don't know if you'll read this case. It's a very fractured decision. There's no majority decision. There's a plurality. But what the Supreme Court did here was they saved federal class actions basically from an encroachment by narrower, more constrictive um, state class action rules. And had they ruled the other way, uh, uh, defense lawyers all over the place would have used a contrary decision basically to undercut federal class actions. So they, my cut on that is they saved Rule 23 from uh, state constricted class action rules, and that, that's a good thing. All right, sometimes the court fixes problems. ExxonMobil versus Alipata. All right, <laughs> favorite case. What, uh, uh, again, this is a class action, and prior to ExxonMobil versus Alipata, an enactment of the Supplemental Jurisdiction Statute, um, plaintiffs and class actions were not permitted to uh, aggregate the damages of all the class members. Everybody separately had an eighty amount controversy. And in construing the Supplemental Jurisdiction Statute uh, in Alipata, uh, the Supreme Court 
in a 5-4 decision, it was very close, uh, basically said the drafters of the statute didn't tend to overrule this Zahn rule. And this is, a, this is a class action decision, by the way, and this is very plaintiff favoring, okay? Um, so for people who would say, um, you know, the court is anti-plaintiff, this is very plaintiff favoring. Crook, you know, Kripsky versus Co uh, Costa Cartieri, 2009. Um, this was a decision from the Supreme Court clarifying Rule 15C, which is a rule that allows typically plaintiffs to amend their complaints to relate back from the filing um, of the original complaint. And what the court here said was um, they were uh, asked, they were tasked with interpreting um, who has to know what uh, at the time and about the mistake. And the court said it depends on the defendant's knowledge of, of wh whether there was a mistake, not the plaintiff's knowledge. And again, this is a very plaintiff favoring decision. All right, um, and a good one because you can amend your complaint and you're not going to get thrown out of court on this kind of technicality. Hertz Corporation versus Friend. We get up to this case and say, a friend case is your friend. <laughs> all right, what did the court <laughs> Too easy. Um, all right, what the court did here. Um, was very, this is from uh, 2010, and up until this time there had been, as the procedure teachers all know, about five or six tests running around all of the circuits. They were all very different with how you define corporate citizenship for the purpose of establishing diversity. And it was another kind of um, confusion, doctrinal confusion among cases that led to gamesmanship. And the court came back and very sensibly, I don't know if it was Justice Scalia, but he said, sometimes a simple black letter rule okay, um, is a good rule. And that's what they did here. And civil procedure teachers can breathe a sigh of relief. All right, as well as students. All right, my third theme is um, sometimes the court knows its own limits, all right? And you should praise the court when they know their own limits. Finley versus the United States. Uh, this was decided in 1989. This was the second time, okay, that the Supreme Court had the opportunity to decide whether or not pendant party jurisdiction was permissible. <laughs> And in a decision by Justice Scalia for the second time that the court was asked to consider this, um, he said, no, no pendant party jurisdiction, blah, blah, blah. But when you get down to the last paragraph in that decision, Scalia says, look, okay, it's really not for us to make the determination about um, the acceptability of pendant party jurisdiction. This is really a, a policy decision that has to be decided um, by the Congress, and please send us over to the legislature. So it was an expression by the court that they knew the limitations and they knew what they were doing was unpopular because up until then there had been a lot of blowback uh, from the low, lower federal courts. Why can't we have pendant party jurisdiction? And within one year, one year of Finley, Congress enacted the wonderful supplemental jurisdiction <laughs> statute, right? Which at least in 1367A, okay, does allow for pendant party jurisdiction. All right, Fund versus Halliburton. Um, uh, this is 2011 from the Supreme Court, and this was the second time that this case had gone up to the Supreme Court. And um, there, there were two, um, two Halliburton cases, um, but what the court did here, uh, this is security uh, fraud litigation, and the Supreme Court actually saved the fraud on the market presumption, which is very, very favorable to plaintiffs, because it allows plaintiffs to pursue um, class action litigation, uh, basically in uh, the in the uh, securities market for securities fraud, um, and if they didn't have the fraud on the market presumption, these cases wouldn't get certified because of lack of predominance. All right, so um, the court again they had the opportunity to get rid of the fraud on the market presumption, and they decided not to. Smith versus Bayer Corp. This is another um, uh, decision in the class action arena. This is also from 2011. By the way, that's that horrible year, okay, um, uh, you know, the downward arc. There was a lot of interesting stuff going on in the court in 2011. And this was an interesting case. It basically dealt with the problem of having parallel class action litigation going on in the federal and the state courts. And um, the basic issue here was whether or not a federal court could use the Anti-Injunction Act to shut down what was going on in the state court in a parallel state court class action. And to my absolute surprise, the Supreme Court said no. Okay, you couldn't do that, and it's because um, state courts have different class action rules, okay, and we're not going to allow the federal court to interfere with ongoing state class action proceedings. 
And that, by the way, again, is a very plaintiff favoring decision uh, from the Supreme Court. All right, and then in 2014, that was the replay of uh, the Halliburton case. And again, for the second time, the Supreme Court came back and they saved the Ford on the market presumption uh, uh, from uh, being undercut. All right, uh, the Boron Advisory Committee, um, bless their butt. So um, the Advisory Committee and the rulemaking function comes in for a fair amount of criticism from uh, Professor Vitiello uh, and a lot of academic um, literature. Uh, and, and usually the argument is the rules are partisan, they're le leading to not allowing plaintiffs to have good access to courts, they're closing down the courthouse uh, roof, uh, the courthouse doors. But what I want to suggest to you is if you look, there are, um, the advisory committee has engaged in some good rule elements. I want to talk about those. All right, uh, Rule 11C. I'm glad you're just doing it. All the procedure people not All right. So Rule 11C uh, was amended, actually Rule 11 was amended in 1993. And that was a decade, a complete decade after it had been amended in 1983, which led to this decade-long reign of terror, where attorneys all over the place were being sanctioned with very high monetary funds. And by the way, the person who introduced that amendment in 1993, who was Arthur Miller. I don't know if anybody knows that, but he was responsible for that. Anyway, by the end of the decade, um, the practicing bar was just up in arms, uh, and they went to the advisory committee, and they realized they had to do something. And um, the amended rule, Rule 11C, provides for a safe harbor provision. So um, you have to give notice to the opposing counsel that you intend to file, file a Rule uh, 11 sanction motion, but it gives um, uh, opposing counsel 21 days to fix the error, right? And then the motion becomes basically moot. And it's interesting, after this amendment was adopted, Rule 11 sanctioning motions just disappeared. They absolutely disappeared. And so this is a good thing, it's something good, and it's very, very effective. This is controversial. <coughs> Rule 16. Rule 16 has been amended uh, several times, it's getting longer and longer. But the heart and the guts of Rule 16 um, are a lot of meet and confer provisions. Um, and it's the pre-trial conference provision. And it also um, forces the court to set up a scheduling order very early on. It's basically a judicial case management uh, provision. And I think it's very good. They're requiring, the rule also requires that um, the parties have an authorized person to appear at these pretrial conference with authority, basically, um, to enter into settlement and a lot of other things. Um, for people who believe um, that litigation ought to go to trial, this is the whole um, anti-settlement, uh, you know, the vanishing trial cohort of people, they don't like, okay, judicial case management. So I realize there's a whole literature out there that do not like increased judicial management, but I actually um, think it's pretty good. 23F. Um, 23F is part of the Place Action Rule. It was enacted in 1998. This definitely solved the problem. Prior to um, 1998, there was no provision for interlocutory appeals of class certification orders. So if you were the losing party on a class certification or, um, motion, the judge had to certify his or her, her own order for immediate appeal under 1292B. But if the judge didn't, you only had one other route for getting interlocutory appeal, and that was through mandamus. And what was going on in the 1990s, particularly in the mass tort um, class action arena, all these cases were going up to judges on named games. And in um, 1996, Judge Posner in Roan Poulain, okay, which was the tainted blood class certification, he spends the first half of that decision wringing his knuckles, okay, basically over how upset he is because the ca case came up on mandamus. And what he was saying was that this was a mis misuse of mandamus. Mandamus is only supposed to be used in extraordinary circumstances. But it had become very, very routine in the class action arena. And the advisory committee listened to Judge Posner. And they put this on their agenda, and they created Rule 23F. So now there's a provision for interlocutory appeals class certification orders. Um, 26A, and again, I know this is controversial, um, but what this did was require, um, basically, mandatory disclosures at the outset of litigation. And when this was proposed, by the way, there was a big firestorm of comments from various uh, lawyers and ac academics all over the place. Uh, but what it does is, without having to file a request for disclosure of a whole bunch of stuff at the beginning, the rule just says you have to turn this over. 
And again, I think it was a really sensible amendment to the rule. It's a good rule. It's like, why should you have to spend all this time and money, okay, filing a motion for disclosure, and then somebody comes back and refuses, and then you have to file a motion to compel. And the court says, we know in every case you're going to have to turn over all this stuff, just go do it. Right? So sometimes they do this stuff. And then this should be 26 F, by the way. This is a procedure you can have a mistake. <laughs> There's a mistake on this slide. It should be 26 F. But 26 F is kind of parallel to um, Rule 16, and it's lodged in the discovery rules, but it's another meet and confer. And I think all these meet and confer provisions are very, very good. All right. This is, my, <laughs> this is my last theme here, which is no, the sky is not falling. I, I took it a little bit. All right. Uh, okay. So typically, what happens every time on the Supreme Court hands down a decision or there's a new rule amendment, almost instantaneously within the academy and the practice in bar, people start running around and saying, this is the most horrible thing. Like, it's really awful. Denial of access to justice, closing of the courthouse doors, it's very, very predictable. So I want to talk about three instances where this happened, and it's kind of, I just want to give you something to think about. Um, professor, the famous professor, Arthur Miller, has an interesting theory about reactions to court, Supreme Court decisions and rulemaking. And it's a pendulum theory. And he said whenever any, anything new happens, he said after it happens, the pendulum swings out kind of mass hysteria, right? And the courts are kind of over-enforcing or over-interpreting. And then he said what happens with the pendulum is it swings, swings back, okay, in reaction against the over-enforcement and the kind of under-enforcement. And he said eventually the pendulum comes to rest at equilibrium. Um, and I think there's a lot to be said for that theory. Um, so summary judgment. Um, there was a great deal of hysteria around the 1986 trilogy. And the general interpretation was, this is terrible. Uh, you know, the court the judges are going to be dismissing cases on summary judgment all over the place. Um, plaintiffs are going to be out of court. And we've had a long span of time now. Okay, and empirical studies just don't show that that's been true. In the years after the trilogy, there was an uptick, okay, in some judges issuing more summary judgment motions. But it quickly, it didn't even go in the other direction. It just quickly went back to equilibrium. So, I mean, the hype about summary judgment just has really not happened. Only it will. <clears throat> okay, so if there are two decisions from the Supreme Court in recent years that have been more reviled, okay, it's been Twombly it will. And what I want to talk here is, should say, kind of judicial non compliance rather than nullification. But sometimes we get decisions from the Supreme Court and they're kind of so horrific, okay, that the lower court judges kind of push back. All right, and they engage in non-compliance. And courts have very interesting ways of you know, reading these cases and saying, well, okay, the prevailing standard now is formally equal, but I think this case and the pleadings actually here uh, can be construed to come within the requirements of formally equal. The problem here is we're not enough distant okay, to see truly what the impact has been. There have been some early studies okay, that do indicate that in the subset of civil rights cases, there's been, again, an uptick of, of pleadings basically being thrown out on formally equal, but that's not true for the rest of the docket. Place actions, anti-place action. Okay, so and this is really my wheelhouse, place action stuff. And there's this huge stereotype about how um, the Supreme Court is pro-corporate defendant, anti-plaintiff, and particularly in the class action arena. Um, and, I looked at, and at the back end of Professor Vitiello's book, he does recognize, okay, because I was like, I want to see if he has to say that question. And he does recognize that the record of the court has been mixed. So if you just focus on Walmart versus Dukes, which is what everybody does, okay, it's like a horrible decision. But in the corpus of decisions that have been decided by the Supreme Court, at least in the 10 years, a whole bunch of them have actually favored um, plaintiffs. So the record is actually very mixed. So in addition to the Halliburton cases, by, what, by the way, a third case um, dealing with the fraud on the market presumption uh, is a case called Amgen. And they had another opportunity in the Amgen case to um, repudiate the fraud on the market presumption. Three times the decision went to the Supreme Court, and they upheld it. And that's such a strong pro-plaintiff decision in the class action arena that it defies the stereotype. Um, in uh, 2002, Supreme Court issued a class action decision in a case called Devlin versus Scarletti. 
And this said, basically, an objector did not have to intervene in the class action in order to bring an appeal, right? And so that's a great decision on behalf of objectors who are objecting to uh, settlements in the case. Um, in 2016, court decided another class action decision, Tyson Food, um, and basically, uh, in this case, dealing with donning and doffing um, uh, uniforms when you're in a chicken plant. Anyway, um, again, it was a very pro-plaintiff decision, and the court said that um, a class action representatives, they could use statistical sampling, basically, um, uh, to prove up class-wide predominance. So again, even though the stereotype is that the Supreme Court is really pro-corporate, anti-plaintiff in the class action arena, the record, quite frankly, um, is somewhat, it's really mixed. Um, and we have, this is... Another um, way that kind of reaffirms this, this is a quotation from an amicus brief, an amicus brief filed by the Chamber of Commerce, which is the archetype of the pro-corporate um, pro um, organization. And this was filed in a case called Frank versus Goas, which was just argued before the Supreme Court on October 31st, dealing with, uh, dealing with C. Craig. But in their amicus brief, they did, the Chamber of Commerce did not side with either party in this case, but they filed an amicus brief, and in it, um, they said, what they were asking the court to do in this case, the Chamber seeks to highlight that the explosion of cypher settlements in class action litigation is a symptomatic, uh, symptomatic of a much deeper problem. This is what they wanted the court to focus on. Focus on. The failure of lower courts to comply with this court's precedent and rig rigorously police the requirements of Rule 23. So the United States Chamber of Commerce was complaining that notwithstanding all these presumably pro-corporate class action decisions are coming in and saying the lower courts are not complying with them, right? You are systematically favoring plaintiffs. And I read that I thought that's really kind of interesting. All right. Anyway, what's my conclusion? So is the arc of procedure bending towards new justice? And my answer is, uh, if you look at when you read the book, the answer is yes. Um, but I think, um, I, just want, I just wanted you to think about that. If you take a different universe of cases and you look at some other stuff, um, how would we answer that question? And I think what we need here is just a subtly more nuanced uh, narrative, okay, about what's going on uh, in procedure land. That's it. That's it. <laughs>Got some uh, time for questions. If you have a question for Professor Mullinex or the Grim Reaper, just, uh, <laughs> raise your hand. I have a question for uh, Professor Mullinex. Uh. So, if you were um, thinking about current lower uh, federal courts, do you think you, uh, with a, a large number of Trump appointees, do you think that anything that you would say might you predict that that the arc might change a little bit? Yeah, no, I, I agree with you at the end, and I think that there's, um, th well, there's concern with the current administration and their ability to um, to push, plow through, and fill, fill large numbers of seats on the federal bench. Yeah. So uh, maybe we need to come back and well, five, I, absolutely, I, five I, years and see how bad it gets. You know, I have but, a second. Uh, I have a second book in in, um, in in the back of my mind about about what's going to happen. But one of the things she was referring to, some of the norms that have historically been followed have forced presidents to appoint somewhat more moderate, more centrist judges, the filibuster, and then a, something called, the, is it the blue slip? Yeah. But where um, senators, for example, could yeah. object they don't do that anymore. to appointees, and they've just gotten rid of it. Mitch McConnell has been sort of leading the way to, to make sure that the appointments are... Yeah, the other interesting thing that, um, that's happened, by the way, and, and my view is almost the entire academic community in the procedure land, um, a lot, there's two generations. So our generation, okay, we're definitely the procedural due process people. Um, and then the other thing you need to know is an astonishingly high percentage of law professors have gone to either Harvard or Yale. Okay, and so they've also been schooled in procedural due process, and they make up basically uh, the professoriate. So what's interesting, and this is what I, I can't know, okay, but there does seem to be a younger generation of people coming through, surprisingly, um, 
you know, who are more conservative, um, and and they're going to be, again, you know, filling the bench, and they're also being schooled by various outside um, organizations, right? So, I don't I don't know whether you're probably right. Well, let's come back in five years. <laughs> <clears throat> Any questions? Raise your hand. This young man. <laughs> well, for actually, oh, for me, oh, for, for, for Professor Vitello, I, I just or or Professor Mullinex, but if if uh, if the federal courts are going to be as bad as you projected, why would why would we want to go through that door? Why wouldn't we just want to go to state court anyway? So why should we be concerned about the procedural uh, obstacles to getting in? Uh, well, there are still rights on the books that we would want enforced. And then the other thing is the shift towards removal, making it easier to remove actions to federal court so that <clears throat> the more liberal state court actions are going to be... Um, I'm trying to think of, a, of a, a good example where an action was removed, and as soon as it was removed, would it be in CAFA where some of the, yeah, yeah CAFA. for example, yeah, CAFA, CAFA, yeah. Um, so that it makes it easier to remove uh, based on minimal diversity, and then once it's in federal court, it's much more difficult to advance the class action. So it's, um, there's a back door to federal courts uh, and a front door. Um, so that would be my answer. And your, your question is, why wouldn't you want to go into state court? My, my response to that is, it depends on the state. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you, California. Yeah, no, uh, <laughs> and, and I'm from Texas, so we, we have a very different answer. To... In fact, one of the problems with that is once you get into court, it's now all about settlement. I mean, it, yeah. it, the idea that you're going to go to trial and actually vindicate these rights is, is just a, something of the past. They're going to push you to settle. Um, yeah, Cipre, Cipre or Cypre. Um, I usually, can, I write for preview, and so I, I write up all the pre cases for preview, um, and I read all the briefs and the amicus briefs. Um, there was a huge number of amicus briefs on both sides of this. I think it's a very complicated problem because um, the, the ideological alignment, okay, of pl plaintiffs versus defendants isn't true in this case. Um, because you would think um, uh, reflexively that defendants would be against Cypre, but they're not, okay, because they like to do settlements, okay, where they can uh, cut a deal for Cypre. So that's the, the case is, um, the underlying class action settlement was with Google. I don't know if you all know about this case. It had, the Google class action had 129 million members in the class. 129 million members in the class. It boggles the mind. What the settlement was, it gave zero, nothing, okay, to 129 million people. It gave 6.5 million to six charities, and the attorneys got 2.5 million in attorney's fees. And of the six designated charities that the money, the Cypre money was gonna go to, four of them were the law schools um, of, the, uh, yeah, of, the, of the lawyers who brought the case. So um, Cypre has been attacked in, uh, Chief Justice Roberts, uh, about three or four years ago, had he signaled uh, in a uh, where there was a, a denial of cert, he signaled that the Supreme Court was very interested in the issue. Um, so I think I think they're going to strike a middle position. Okay, I think that they are going to put some limitations on how how you can do Cypre and when you can do Cypre. But I don't think they're going to say you can't do it at all because it would be like throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And actually, I, I had a conversation within the last week or so with my law school dean, and, and he's, who, he's kind of a right-wing federalist type person. So he was really against, telling me how he was against it. And then he sat back and he said, but as a dean, I'm in favor of it. <laughs> so. Can you do like a two sentence what Cypre is oh. for the first year students who might not know? Cypre, okay, so actually Cypre comes out of uh, decedents a state trust for anybody who knows this. And um, it's a doctrine which says if you can't locate um, all of the members of an aggregation, or it would be too financially ridiculous, okay, to have to, with 129 million people, it would be too difficult to locate them all um, and give them, you know, 10 cents in compensation. Rather than doing that, 
um, you can make uh, you can make a settlement that's going to give a fund basically to charitable organizations or organizations that have some relationship to what the underlying litigation is. So in the in the Google case, four of the designated organizations were law schools, but the other two were foundations that are dealing with research into privacy rights, um, you know, under the new internet. Um, and, and by the way, the, um, the argument against CPRE, and it's kind of the Marty Reddish argument, um, which is that it's illegitimate in a class action. What CPRE does, he says, is taking away the property rights that adhere to the members of the class, right? And they should be getting some benefit. And by just taking the money and saying, oh, we're going to make a CPRE distribution, you're denying class members of a property right. But I don't think the court's going to go there. And the other thing, the other thing you should know is um, the American Bar Association also filed a brief, an amicus brief, but they were one of three different organizations that filed um, a brief before the Supreme Court not supporting either party. But what the ABA brief said was really interesting, and they said to the court, please do not throw out Cypre, because the, um, a, a large number of the beneficiaries of Cypre awards are legal aid institutions, and because legal aid institutions are now not being funded very well, um, by the government, you know, so that's why I think the court's not going to throw it out. Yeah, and, and law school clinics are large, uh, and that's why your dean works. Like yeah. Can I, can I, Mary Beth, uh, there's yeah. one more thing I wanted to mention to Brian. The personal jurisdiction cases arise out of state cases, too, yeah. and they really are closing the door there in very dramatic ways, as Rich will tell you later. Okay. Any other questions? Yep. Uh, so this is for Professor Molnix. Um, so something I was kind of just thinking through as you were uh, speaking was, uh, you know, the federal judiciary is currently taking on like, a lot of interesting questions, maybe around like uh, campaign financing or like voting rights. And so I was just curious in like response to some of your themes, how what would your advice be to um, us as the future uh, civil proceduralists, how, how, should, how can we effectively, um, you know, uh, litigate cases that may be very difficult to get through, um, like, lower uh, federal courts who are, are now, like, very, um, there's been this major ideological shift, and so if there's no controversy, the courts are all in agreement on some of these like issues that are a huge concern to us, how can we effectively use civil procedure to um, you know, make it easier? Okay, good question, and I'm glad you're asking that as a law student who's going to be going out there, and it's like, how can, how can you have an effect um, or an, uh, an impact? So um, the, the types of things you're talking about are over in substantive law land, and Professor Vitiello's book begins with a very interesting comment, and it's a comment about Erie, which is absolutely true. Um, but people out there generally in the public domain, procedure decisions get no attention, right? It's kind of, they get no respect, and it's the Rodney Dangerfield part of, you know, <laughs> the academic universe. Um, but what people don't understand is procedure is so important, okay? Because pr procedure is going to have a big effect on outcomes and access to courts and so on. And if you want to affect substantive law, okay, then you really do need to pay attention what's going on um, in procedure. Um, you can't do so much over in the court, you know, the judicial case of law, but what you can have an effect is in the rulemaking process. And so every time there's a proposed rulemaking, we have extensive notice and comment periods, and anybody can, and the, uh, the advisory committee goes around and holds public meetings where anybody can come in and go up to the mic and say, I'm not in favor of this rule because it's going to have this effect, right? Um, and then also when Congress is considering kind of any changes, also you can always write your congressperson or you can submit comments. Um, so there, there are ways of becoming engaged with helping to um, have an effect on what procedure um, is going to be. And I encourage you to use your voices, okay? And, and become, you are the new generation of social justice warriors. And the point here is, be aware, it's not only the substantive stuff, it is the procedural stuff, which is so, so important. All right, I feel much better um, <laughs> with, with this comment. Uh, was there one more question? Yeah, up in the back. Um, yeah. It was just sort of um, responding to the, the question um, in that, you know, um, it seems like a lot of these people have fears of um, the incoming judiciary. So are there 
who will be the, most, the first responsive people to this conservative movement? So we're fearful about the federal doors getting getting closed. We're going to stay tuned, but. Yeah, well, if you haven't done it already, the other response to this is vote. Yeah. Vote. Early vote, and often. Vote. Yeah. Just one. <laughs> <laughs> because the composition of the federal judiciary is not going to change unless we have a change in administration. So, yeah, that's the message. All right, why don't we take a break until about quarter Thanks. till. Okay. We'll get the next yeah, panel set. Point. Thank you very much. Thank you. In panel number two, which I have the pleasure of moderating, we're going to talk about the specific ways the door is closing because of federal civil procedure decisions and mechanisms. And um, first of all, thank you all. I know that you're... Some of you might be mandated to be here, but how much better is this than listening to me, right? It's good. So you're all happy, and I am too. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing our panel, and our first panelist is Professor Richard Freer from Emory. He's the Charles Howard Candler Professor of Law. Um, he's not sitting next to me, but because they switched, but he's going to be the first one to talk. Um, he's the author of 17 books, including the textbook that those of you in Professor Vitello's class use. And he's, um, uh, fun facts, I'm not, you have full bios in the booklets, so you can read about all of his amazing accomplishments and all of, all of these people's amazing accomplishments. So I'm just telling fun facts. Um, fun fact, he's a San Diego sports fan. He's a Barbary guru, and a lot of you I know watch his videos. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Much to my chagrin. They all say, he's so funny, and like, I'm not, you know, but I am too. Anyway, okay. Um, next to me is Professor Tom Main. He is the William S. Boyd Professor of Law at UNLV. He is also the author of lots of books, including the case book that my students are reading, The Red Book. And he also is uh, the co-author of a transnational litigation book, which he co-authors with our own professor, Steve McCaffrey, who was here but maybe left, oh. gone. Um, <laughs> so most important to me, Professor Main is uh, a, a Boston Red Sox fan and a marathon runner and a really good friend of mine. So thank you for being here. Um, And we have Professor Don Durenberg. He was, he's been a civil procedure professor for about 40 years. He taught most of those years at Pace University, and we have had the very good fortune that he moved out to this neck of the woods and lives up the hill with three horses. So he comes and is a visitor here at McGeorge now for the last several years and um, also uh, will be again next year. He teaches civil procedure and criminal procedure. He also has authored a whole bunch of books. Read all about it in your booklet. So thank you, Professor Durmer. So the format that we're going to do here is that each of um, these very distinguished professors will talk to you for about 20 minutes, and then we'll take some questions. And um, Professor Freer, you're up first. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. I appreciate all the students who are here, even if you're conscripted, we appreciate it very, very much. <laughs> I'm delighted to be here, and thank you to everyone who had uh, a role in putting this together. I'm just delighted to be part of this symposium and to honor Mike Vitello on his wonderful book, Animating Civil Procedure. And I also learned a lot from this morning's earlier panel, because I thought Cypre was, what are the two reactions you have when you read a law school exam? Sigh. Okay. Oh. It's going to be one of those days. Oh. Yeah. Ooh. They said All he was right. funny. Okay, okay. <laughs> it gets better. <laughs> so, I want to talk about personal jurisdiction, because Mike has taught us a very important rule and a very important lesson, and that is that all the substantive rights in the world are not going to do you any good if you don't have access to a court. Personal jurisdiction. 
The Supreme Court got engaged in this topic in 2011 for the first time in 21 years. And since then, it's decided six personal jurisdiction cases. And so I think it's a good time to take stock on where we are in this new era of personal jurisdiction. But the starting point, of course, is the iconic case of International Shoe from 1945. International Shoe gave us two things to think about. One was there's got to be minimum contact between the defendant and the forum. So it's got to be contact. And number two is the exercise of jurisdiction must comport with fair play and substantial justice. So there's contact and there's talk about fairness or fair play. Shu did not give us a definition for either of those. Shu did not tell us what a contact was, how volitional must it be, how direct must it be. And the international shoe also did not give us content on what it means to have fair play and substantial justice. So in those senses, international shoe was a blank slate. And the first person to write on that slate was Justice Black. Justice Black had a concurring opinion in international shoe, and it reads much more like a dissent, doesn't it? And in that concurrence, he's very worked up about that phrase, fair play and substantial justice, because it's open-ended, it's elastic. And his worry, interestingly, was that this very elastic idea was going to be used to restrict state court power. And he invoked the Tenth Amendment. He said it would be a violation of the Tenth Amendment to restrict state court jurisdiction based on some federal judge's idea of what happened to be fair. And so that was the idea. He was afraid of restrictions. Now, the court first started deciding cases under international shoe in the 1950s. And the first two cases that the Supreme Court used for specific jurisdiction, and remember specific jurisdiction is where the claim arises from or relates to the defendant's contact with the forum. And isn't it fun to be a, a, in a crowd of just total nerds on this stuff? We're all, it's just all inside baseball. I'm like, oh, I know, are you kidding me? I know specific jurisdiction. <laughs> but the first two times that the court ever applied international shoe in specific jurisdiction cases, what happened? Justice Black wrote both opinions for the court. What was he doing? He was seizing the opportunity to give us an expansive view. And so what were the cases? One was traveler's insurance. 1950 case, doesn't get much, uh, much attention these days. And the other was McGee in 1957, which is a much better known case. In each of these, the court upheld jurisdiction over out-of-state insurance companies. And I want to flag two things about Justice Black's opinions in these cases. First, there is no separation of contact and fairness. It is a melange. He just throws everything into a melange, a mixture about factors on contact, factors on fairness, and comes up with the idea of whether jurisdiction would be okay. The second point is that he does give content to the idea of fair play and substantial justice. He tells us what we should look at there. Things like the state's interest in providing a forum. Things like the plaintiff's interest in suing at home. Things like the litigation efficiency and the factors from forum nonconvenience type analysis. So he puts all of that in there. McGee was a unanimous decision, but the melange test was not to last because <laughs> mere months later in the new term, the Supreme Court decided Hansen versus Denkla. And the background on that case, I invite you to read that in Mike's book, is especially entertaining and interesting. But in Hansen versus Denkla, the court splits five to four, Chief Justice Warren for the majority, and here is Justice Black dissenting. And all of a sudden, Justice Black's fairness factors, uh, interest of the state, interest of the plaintiffs, all that stuff takes a back seat. And the focus in Hansen versus Dankla becomes the defendant's contact with the forum. Actually, it really becomes the defendant itself. Has the defendant forged a purposeful tie, purposeful availment? That's where this comes from. The tie by a third party does not matter. It's got to be that the defendant reaches out to avail itself of the forum. Now, notice, Hansen did not overrule McGee. The court has never overruled McGee. But two cases that came along in the 1980s demonstrate clearly that Hansen won and McGee lost. Now, what are those cases? They are Worldwide Volkswagen and Burger King. Worldwide Volkswagen in 1980, the court bifurcates international shoe. It breaks it into two parts, and so ever since, we've talked about the contact prong of the analysis, and that is separate from the fairness or reasonableness 
contact or prong, or excuse me, prong of the analysis. And not only that, it set up a very rigid two-part approach. There must be a contact, and that is defined by Hansen, purposeful availment contact, before we even look at whether jurisdiction would be reasonable. Without a contact formed by purposeful availment of the defendant, there is no jurisdiction, period, no matter how fair or reasonable or convenient this forum may be. Burger King takes another step, and Burger King imposes a presumption. And the presumption is, once there is a relevant contact, a purposeful availment contact, we presume that jurisdiction is reasonable. And the burden is on the defendant to rebut that. And it's a very difficult, difficult burden to uh, get around because the defendant must show, indeed present a compelling case, that the defendant is put at a severe disadvantage in the litigation. And that's a very tough burden. Not only that, the court went farther. The court said the relative wealth of the parties really doesn't matter. So the fact that we're going to make these two individuals litigate in the corporate plaintiff's backyard, no big deal at all. The court kept saying, you know, nowadays travel is so convenient. And notice they wrote before there was a TSA. That was what was going on there. <laughs> and so we can, we can do that. Now, that means at the end of the 20th century, where were we? Well, with specific jurisdiction, it was all about contact. In fact, that presumption for Burger King made it so difficult for a defendant to defeat jurisdiction based on reasonableness, it's almost impossible to overcome that burden, that the defendant is usually going to re rely on, hey, I did not have a contact. So it was all about contact. And even contact was not defined clearly, at least in the stream of commerce situation, we had the split of authority in Asahi, so we have no rule on what a contact is in that scenario. But it was very clear, contact first. And without that contact, the reasonableness factor is absolutely irrelevant. Now, at the end of the century, what was the state of affairs with general jurisdiction? Ah, remember general jurisdiction, that's where the defendant's being sued on a claim that does not relate to its activities in the forum. And I think at the end of the 20th century, general jurisdiction was in pretty good shape. It was pretty robust. Why? Well, everybody knew that a business, a corporation, could be subject to general jurisdiction where it was incorporated. That had been true for 100 years. Everybody knew that. But there was a very well-established doctrine that corporations could be subject to general jurisdiction based on their activities, based on their contacts with the forum. I agree that the language sometimes differed. I agree there were problem cases at the margin, but it was very, very well understood that a corporation with continuous systematic ties could be sued on a basis of general jurisdiction. Now, what does the new era bring? I think the new era, from 2011 till now, there are three important developments. Number one, specific jurisdiction is still dominated by the need for a contact. And the example that comes to mind, obviously, McIntyre, poor Mr. Nicastro. You have an English corporation manufacturing machine, sends it to an Ohio corporation and says, distribute them all over the country, sell as many as you can. One of them gets sold into New Jersey and it injures Mr. Nicastro while he's at work there. And he cannot sue the manufacturer in his home state. I think that result is just, is just indefensible. <coughs> I think it's stunning. Notice all the pro-jurisdiction factors. In that case, there's no doubt New Jersey has an interest in providing a courtroom for its people. There's no doubt that New Jersey has an interest in workplace safety. There's no doubt Mr. Nicastro had an interest in suing at home. And all of the trial convenience factors said, let's go to New Jersey. All the witnesses were in New Jersey. All the medical evidence was in New Jersey. And yet, all of those factors supports jurisdiction, but every one of those factors is irrelevant. Why? No contact. You've got to have contact first. And six justices, amazingly, over two opinions, decided that there was no relevant contact there in New Jersey. Now, I've never understood this stream of commerce idea and the problem with all this, this theory and that theory. To me, it's very simple. There's a very simple economic issue that would show that there's a contact here. When a manufacturer sends its products to a distributor and tells the distributor, look, there's no limits, just sell it. 
It seems to me that every single time one of those is sold, the manufacturer makes money on that. The English company made money because that particular machine was sold to a company in New Jersey. So it seems to me that's money. You're making money, that's purposeful availment, and that should be a contact. If there's a silver lining in McIntyre, it is that we got no majority opinion on what the test is for contact and stream of commerce. Remember, Breyer and Alito keep their powder dry. They're not going to go either way. So it is possible in a future case that we could get a broad reading of contact. But I'm not real optimistic because the court is so obsessive about that. Contact is more important than anything else. And they showed that with their hypotheticals in the opinions. And these were great. These were just right out of law school classroom. I mean, they were terrific. So we get Justice Kennedy, and Justice Kennedy is worried. Why is he worried? He's worried that a Florida farmer who sells produce through a distributor might get sued in Alaska. And Justice Breyer, Justice Breyer not to be outdone, he's worried about the Appalachian potter. And the <laughs> Appalachian potter who sells through a distributor might get sued in Hawaii because the handle fell off the coffee mug. Now, with all due respect, the problem here and the way to deal with it is not to strain, as they do all the time, to find that there's no contact. The way you deal with this is say, yes, there's a contact. The Appalachian potter made some money when that thing got sold there. And use the reasonableness factors to determine the ultimate, the ultimate outcome. So there, the reasonableness factors would say, yeah, we have jurisdiction in McIntyre for the reasons we stated. But if it's a claim because the handle fell off the mug, no, that's not reasonable. We're not going to make the Appalachian potter go to Hawaii for that case. So that's the first thing. I think contact is just as important as it was at the close of the century. And it keeps us from getting to the fairness or reasonableness issues. Second, this is the most vexing to me. We have eviscerated general jurisdiction. I think the court has basically killed the idea that we can have general jurisdiction based on a corporation's contacts or activities in the forum. We can debate this, but I think they're saying that when a company is at home, that means two states and really never three and certainly never four. It's gonna be general jurisdiction in the state of your incorporation and general jurisdiction in the state where you're headquartered. And I gotta tell you, that was the law before shoe. That's been the law forever, it seems to me. So we have a restriction on general jurisdiction that has never been explained. Now, the court just has never explained it, three of these cases, so we're cutting back on general jurisdiction, but it's pretty obvious what the court was worried about. The court was worried about the so-called F cubed case, where there's a foreign plaintiff, foreign defendant, and a foreign cause of action. That's exactly what Daimler was, and the court simply was not going to have any of it. But the problem is, the restrictions from these cases apply to American plaintiffs too. And so those restrictions apply and make it much tougher for an American citizen to sue a foreign corporation because obviously it's not incorporated in the states and it doesn't have its principal place of business in the states. And this is true even if the claim arises in the US. Think about Mr. Nicastro. He cannot sue under specific jurisdiction in New Jersey. Where is he going to sue? Well, let's go to Ohio based on the continuous and systematic ties of the English company there. Can't do it because they're not incorporated there. No principal place of business there. The third development is something that flows from this restriction on general jurisdiction. There are a bunch of cases now that used to be handled under general jurisdiction for continuous systematic ties. But now it doesn't work. So there's a gap, and a lot of cases fall into that gap. And the problem here, obviously, is not contact. You have plenty of contact. The best example is Bristol Myers Squibb. Lots of contact with California, no doubt about that. The problem is what I think is going to be the new battleground in specific jurisdiction, relatedness. That's the problem. <laughs> the claims of the non-California plaintiffs did not relate sufficiently to the contacts in California. And so the test in Bristol-Myers Squibb is, does the claim arise from or relate to? And Justice Brennan dissected that phrase many years before in Helicopteros, and he says, you know, arise from and relate to are not the same thing. 
there's a subtle distinction. Well, this court is not into subtlety. And so it did not relate to, did not arise from, there is no sliding scale at all. The pills that harmed the non-Californians had no contact with California. So I think the upshot is that the very product that causes harm to a plaintiff must have some connection with the forum state. The fact that an identical product is marketed does not matter. And you know, maybe that's right. I don't know, maybe that's right. To me, it just points out the, la the short-sightedness of curtailing general jurisdiction in an era when specific jurisdiction is not pulling its weight. And Bristol Myers Squibb certainly makes it tougher now to aggregate claims of plaintiffs, even though they are injured by identical products. They're, they're, they, they didn't have a contact with that particular state. So in the new era, turns out, I think maybe Justice Black was onto something. Because I think maybe International Shoe has not expanded jurisdiction like it was supposed to have. Notice, I think general jurisdiction is back to a pre-shoe basis now. And on specific jurisdiction, you get a lot of people thinking that the plurality opinion in McIntyre reads a whole lot like Penoyer versus Neff, with a suggestion that the defendant ought to submit or maybe even consent to jurisdiction. But if Black was right that international shoe has not expanded jurisdiction, he was wrong for the, for the explanation of why. The reason that we have this sclerotic view of personal jurisdiction has nothing to do with fair play and substantial justice. It also is largely laid at the feet of liberal judges. It is Ginsburg who has had this project to eviscerate general jurisdiction. It was Brennan who gave us the presumption in Burger King, which is interesting. But to me, the fascinating thing about that international shoe test about fair play and substantial justice is exactly how little that matters. Fair play and substantial justice just is not part of the equation very much. Why? First of all, in general jurisdiction, Justice Ginsburg said, it's not even on the table. It's not even a relevant factor. And in specific jurisdiction, the reasonableness factors are locked behind two very high walls. One of those walls is you gotta show a defendant initiated contact. And the other, even if you get past that, is you must show this fairly strict idea of relatedness. So it is not a problem that was caused by the elastic concept of fairness. It's a problem that is caused by the court's continuing effort to ignore those elastic concepts. Thank you. Hi there. Um, first, I want to thank uh, Mike Patello for giving us the reason to, to gather and to respond and tackle issues of access, uh, sort of a grab bag of issues. It's, it's fun to sort of see what, where the connections are, even if we leave you to draw some of those connections yourselves. I also want to thank um, the school, um, the, the deans and uh, Mary Beth Moylan for organizing this. Certainly the Law Review for doing all the, the legwork and giving us the intellectual sort of drive to, uh, to, put, to pull this together um, and learn from each other. I, it's a pleasure for me to come back. I taught here for 12 years. I absolutely love this school. I, uh, my son is a graduate of this institution. And uh, for the time that I spent here, I think of myself as an kind of a self-appointed honorary graduate of this institution mm -hmm. because I learned so much from so many folks who are like professional colleagues and then personal friends. I suppose by that metaphor, it took me 12 years to graduate, <laughs> but, um, but I nevertheless learned so much when I was here and I'm forever indebted um, to the folks um, from Mary Beth um, for organizing this and giving me the excuse to come back and, uh, and to share some of my work. But this particular thing that I'm working on is is primarily descriptive and historical. It's normative <laughs> in the sense that all history is sort of revealing uh, patterns and alternatives. My starting point uh, for the talk is that most cases settle. So as you can see here on the slide, even with what you've heard about the heightened pleading standard with Twombly and Iqbal, 
even what we've seen about the summary judgment trilogy cases, relatively few cases are in fact decided by a court order. Instead, they settle voluntarily. This is also true across time. We have pretty good data from 1940 forward, and although the allocation above the line on my slide varies, as you will see during the course of this presentation, the number below the line is re relatively constant for 70 years, that we're relying on this, what I'm calling a passive-aggressive relationship, where there is an aggressive determination of court uh, dispositions, and then that in turn, what we referred to since 1979, the famous article that, that described this relationship between what courts do and what private negotiations do in light of that as a shadow, where the metaphor is that the legal rulings create endowments, and those endowments then form the, the predicate for negotiation between the parties. Now, it's a marvel that this system really works, because if you think about the idea that we're relying on this incredible um, amount of settlement, you can imagine that if we, if we didn't get enough settlements, we'd have a whole lot more work for courts to do. So you can imagine that if we didn't have this broad number of cases being settled, we'd have to deal with them in some other fashion. And similarly, if we had too many settlements, then we would have judges being idle, God forbid, and the idea would be that, that we wouldn't have it calibrated just right. In fact, the system works suspic suspiciously well. We kind of have a, a Goldilocks uh, result here, where what we see over time is we get the right number of terminations year after year. Now, what you're seeing on this slide is three different lines. Um, one of the lines is the number of annual filings. This is federal court, and it's civil only. So what you see in one of the lines, the, the blue line, is the number of filings each year. The orange line is the number of terminations each year. And the gray line is the number of pending cases at the end of the year. And so what we have over time is just <laughs> remarkable consistency that the courts somehow are terminating the right number of cases to, to match the number of filing cases, the new, newly filed cases, and there's sort of a carryover of consistently one year's worth of inventory, even though the number is changing dramatically over this particular period of time. What you see here in this big, uh, the big climb, there's a decade between 1969 and 1983, which I've referred to in some papers as the long decade uh, where during these years we have a tripling in the number of civil filings. Yet even during that whole tripling in the number of civil filings, we still have this uh, co correspondence between all three of these lines. After 1985, on this chart, things get a little squirrely. Mostly that's because of um, multi-district litigation consolidations, which are then resolved in big blocks, which creates a lot of chaos in those numbers. So you'll notice right now the gray is way up above the other two. That's because literally 33% of the pending cases coming into the year were MDL consolidations. And so, so that's what's going on with those lines there. Notice also the blue line is relatively flat on a net basis from 1985 forward. That's because notwithstanding the rhetoric about litigation explosions, in fact, we've had less than 1% of annual growth in this number of civil cases each year since 1985. So that number is relatively flat from 1985 forward. Now I say that it's suspicious, that there is a suspicious number, that this works suspiciously well to have the appropriate number of terminations. Suspicion being, wow, so only 15% of the area under that blue line is court terminations, yet settlements, voluntary settlements, fill the rest of that gap. There's suspicion there. And the suspicion is what, what uh, animates this contemporary discussion about judicial coercion of settlements. And so coercive settlements, I would group them into two categories. The first one is uh, coercive in a technical sense. We could imagine that a lot of settlements are happening because they're direct consequences of the law casting a shadow. So the idea is that even if we have a relatively small percentage of cases um, being resolved by a particular motion, again, that's establishing certain legal endowments that then would lead to particular settlements. Well, those are 
coerced only in a technical sense. Those are not what I mean by the judicial coercive settlement practices. Um, it, uh, instead, what I'm referring to is cir cir circumstances where the concern is that judges are pressuring parties to settle. So it's the shadow not of the, of the legal standard, but it's instead the shadow of an iron fist from a judge who is threatening the parties to settle. And maybe the motion isn't what's casting the shadow. Maybe the parties could survive the motion. Maybe the parties would like to litigate. But instead, there is this phenomenon or this concern about judicial, uh, judicial uh, case management, the scourge of judicial case management that's requiring people to settle even when they don't want to. Now, judicial coercion of settlements is definitely a problem, I think, but this graph doesn't prove it. Uh, it doesn't prove it because if you notice, there's also a lot of settlement in all of these earlier years on my chart. This chart's beginning in 1940 over on the left-hand side. And from 1940 to 1975, there's essentially no uh, uh, case management. Yet notice we're getting the right number of settlements in that era too. So we, this isn't the chart that proves that there is judicial coercion of settlements. What's really explaining this chart above me here is that the median time from filing to termination of a case in federal court is nine months and has been nine months for 50 plus years. That's been consistent. The median time from filing, it's always between seven and 10 months for 50 years. That number has been relatively constant, but sort of like charting the number of births and the number of pregnancies, you're gonna get a lot of overlap in these because the idea of what's re represented here is just the cases are so, so quickly resolved in federal court as a relative matter that you don't wind up uh, with a lot of gaps. And so because cases are just resolved relatively quickly, even for cases that are tried, by the way, are procedural unicorns, cases that actually make it to trial, the median time for termination in those cases is only about two years, maybe three years sometimes. But even those are relatively short. Now, what I want to do is focus on this chart here and, and, and look in particular at a moment in the middle of that steep climb. And so I want a reference point where I'm going to use as a reference point 1975, which is a representative year in the middle of that steep climb during that so-called litigation explosion. <laughs> And what you see here in this particular chart is that you've got above the line, you've got the number of court-ordered terminations. And so in 1975, these numbers aren't going to match what you saw on that first slide because this is 1975. So what you see here in 1975 is almost no cases are resolved by motions to dismiss. Motions to dismiss, this is the notice pleading era. This is the era when you don't even bring a 12b6. You don't need, this isn't the point of these new liberal federal rules. As late as 1983, in fact, there was an effort to abrogate the 12b6 motion. The thinking being, this thing is just in the way. People bring it sometimes, thinking it means something, but it really serves no purpose. Efforts to abrogate the particular rule. Similarly, in 1975, even in the middle of that steep climb, when the civil caseload is tripling over the course of that long decade, what you see is summary judgment playing a very minor role during this period. Summary judgment was an extraordinary remedy. Summary judgment wasn't the way to terminate cases. Similarly, in 1980, after this period, efforts to revise summary judgment changed the rule. The advisory committee received proposals to amend Federal Rule 56 to have it play a role because it wasn't playing a role. So you can see here the role that it isn't playing. So motions to dismiss aren't casting a shadow. Summary judgments aren't casting that shadow. Trials are casting that shadow. In 1975, we're getting roughly, what do we have here? 11% of cases or so being resolved by trials. So cases are be reaching trial in approximately 11% 11, 11 of cases are resolved at trial, and so that's casting the shadow. The shadow is below the line. So above the line here in my chart are court-ordered terminations. Below the line are settlements. So we have the aggressive above the line and the passive below the line. The trials are casting a shadow. Nothing else is casting a shadow here, but yet we see a lot of settlements. And so each of these tick marks is representing 1% 
of the 100% of cases on the timeline here, the four clusters below the line don't match up neatly with the moments of 12B6 and 56 because those motions weren't even brought in a lot of cases because they serve no role. But what those clusters represent below the line, below the, uh, on the bottom half of my chart here, are first, the number of cases that are resolved without any court action at all. So the largest cluster there is the number of cases in 1975 where after filing, the parties reach a resolution, again, in the shadow of a trial, but in the idea that this first cluster is where there's no court action at all. The second cluster is before the pretrial conference. In an era when there were trials, there was something called a pretrial conference that was a week or two before the trial. And in that pretrial conference, in anticipation of that, some cases would settle. And that second cluster there is cases that are settling before a pretrial conference. The third and fourth categories are at or after the pretrial conference and the trial itself. So these are all the cases, sort of this cluster over here underneath Rule 56 is the cluster of cases that are essentially settling on the courthouse steps. We're on the eve of trial, cases are being resolved. And so this is a picture of 1975. For reasons that I explore in other, or another article that, 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 I, that I'm publishing right now, it, 1985 proves to be a really key year in transitioning from this other era that Professor Botello and others have talked about to this contemporary era. And I might slip and refer to it as the third and the fourth era because those are, those are sort of chronologically in the history of Anglo-American civil procedure, strike that, in the history of American civil procedure, there, this is sort of the third era and the fourth era historically. The third being captured in this visual in 1975 and the fourth being all the things that we're worried about, caring about in this discussion of access to justice. And I, and I suggest that 1985 is a key moment in this, in the, in this uh, story, because in 1985, what we notice is, is that the total number of civil cases disposed at trial begins to decline. So, 1985 is after that steep decline in the increase in the number of cases. It's already flattened out. It flattens out 1983, this is 1985. After it's flattening out, the total number, this is not a percentage, this is the total number of civil cases disposed at trial peaks in 1985 and is all the way now down way below it was uh, in, in the 1940s. So in the whole modern era of federal courts, notwithstanding increases in the number of judges, notwithstanding increases in the number of cases, these are the number of cases that are actually going to trial. Similarly, if this chart is looking at the total number, another interesting chart for me as I'm obsessing about 1985 in these recent cluster of articles, is 1985 is also when we see the big pivot in the decline in this particular chart. This chart is capturing on a per judge basis because of course the number of judges was increasing during that big climb, that long decade between 69, 1969 and 1983. But on a per judge basis, of course the number of judges was also increasing but it wasn't keeping pace. But even during that steep decline, when on a per judge basis, the average judge's civil caseload doubled. She nevertheless was, to the extent that the before the pivot on this chart is more or less flat in that 1.7 range, 1.7 before the steep decline, even during that steep decline, judges were on an absolute basis still doing just as many trials as they were for decades before. But in 1985 is when we give up. So judges, in 1985, we see the steep pivot here where judges no longer going to have almost two civil trials a month, and instead the steep decline goes all the way down now where the average judge has about three, maybe four trials per year. And it's important here to talk about what a definition of the word trial is in this statistic. It would even include perhaps a consolidated preliminary injunction consolidated into a final injunction, permanent injunction. So the, even the idea of trial here is probably generous, but trials are just simply vanishing. And that's one of the concerns that we have as far as this access to justice, because the vanishing trial has other uh, 
components to it that give us great cause for concern. Now in 19, the, the, I'm sorry, the key insight here, uh, so now if we look at 2017, uh, what we see in 2017 is once the trial is abandoned, so if we're not going to resolve cases by trial, instead what we're going to do, this is now capturing what, what was the first slide, where I said 2 to 4% of cases are being resolved on the 12B6, 8 to 10% being resolved on a summary judgment motion. So you see the tick marks here above the line at Rule 56. That's now where the shadow is being created. The shadow is being created for understandable reasons. We have judges who used to be able to threaten trial, count on the trial to cast the shadow. But if they aren't going to have trials, and there are reasons why they're abandoning it in 1985, I can talk to you about it if it interests you, but if they're going to abandon trials in 1985, as they do slash must, well then they need other shadow casting motions. And so it isn't a surprise then that we see motions to dismiss and summary judgment motions trying to fill this role. Otherwise, judges are going to have cases without the aggressive component of the passive-aggressive uh, combination to ensure that they're getting enough settlements. Otherwise, they're just going to be having cases that they're somehow going to have to settle, but they're going to have no way to get rid of them if they don't settle. No surprise then that 12b6 and summary judgment motions fill that vacuum and the idea is that we also know that these were motions where this change that we're worried about in this modern era came from trial courts, not from rule amendments. As we know, when we studied Twombly and Iqbal, there's no change in Federal Rule 8A2. There's no change in the summary judgment motion. What there was was lower courts, lower courts, before the Supreme Court decisions, lower courts were the ones who were feeling this pressure. And my thesis is, is that they needed these motions to cast a shadow in order to generate enough settlements, and so that's what we see. Now, so, so below the line, the same four clusters as I had on my previous chart, but as you start comparing them, I move the clusters uh, chronologically uh, in, in comparing these two charts, because now the pretrial conference is much earlier than it was in 1975. Now we have a Rule 16 conference roughly four months after the case is filed. And so we have pretrial conference. At, before the pretrial conference is the second cluster in my, in my 2017 data here. The second cluster would be the before pretrial conference. The third cluster is at or after the uh, pretrial conference. And the fourth cluster is at trial itself. That first category would be the without any court action at all. And because of aggressive case management, there are very few cases now, there are relatively few cases now, that are resolved without any court action at all. So this then sets up the dynamic, where basically the theme is we're creating a new shadow by using 12b-6 and summary judgment motions to cast that shadow to maintain that passive-aggressive relationship of formal adjudication. Now, the key insight here is not... That the, that it's just that the day of reckoning is coming earlier for plaintiffs. That would be bad enough. If we were just moving the day of reckoning earlier in the litigation, that would be bad enough. But that's not what my key, key insight is. Instead, my, my argument is, is that this is a fundamental alteration of the relationship between the aggressive and the passive <laughs> components of formal adjudication. In 1975, the, cast, the, the shadow is cast by a trial. But think about it. Either party can win a trial. The leverage created by the shadow of a trial can benefit both parties. It will benefit the stronger of the two parties. That's the shadow that's being created. The legal endowments that are the product of the prospect of a trial is that whoever has the stronger case is in a stronger position. In contemporary litigation, the shadow is cast by a motion to dismiss or a motion for summary judgment. There's asymmetry here. Plaintiffs who prevail on a motion to dismiss merely live another day on the litigation timeline. Plaintiffs who prevail on a motion for summary judgment merely live another day on the litigation timeline. But if, there, if the another day never includes a trial, if it can't include a trial, then the plaintiff's only leverage 
in the course of generating those settlements below the line is the idea that they're providing a nuisance to the defendant, that they are litigating this, their ultimate fate is known, I can't try the case, I'm going to lose one way or another, but I can keep litigating to maintain the litigation itself. My opposition to the reframing of the litigation to this from trials to these other motions is not nostalgia for trials, although I have nostalgia for trials. This isn't an argument that the Seventh Amendment is being compromised, although notice that it is. Imagine if we took another one of the Bill of Rights and started compromising it in this fashion. Dare I dream? You let me pick the amendment. <laughs> but this isn't an argument about the Seventh Amendment. This isn't even an argument that trials are the best method for integrating law and fact, because I'm not sure that they are. There are other ways of integrating law and fact, but trials are the only mechanism in the current system where plaintiffs can win. Accordingly, trials are an essential component of litigation. Now, the stages of litigation lead to an event. The event is supposed to be a trial. Otherwise, it's merely a gauntlet of punishment on this timeline without the prospect of a trial at the end. Now, to be sure, the combined effect of contemporary reforms, including the ones that are in the orbit of what I'm talking about here, they look ideological because the reforms present as anti-plaintiff. And that's our common instinct as academics, anti-plaintiff, anti-law enforcement, because we're concerned about constituencies that don't have a voice in the process, and so our instinct is to go there to make sure they do have a voice. Yet I don't think that this is necessarily deeply ideological. In fact, the ideological explanations for the surfacing of 12b6 and summary judgment in this context are quite problematic. These reforms originated as trial court reforms by both judges from Republican presidents and Democratic presidents. You do the work here, you see that, wow, this isn't a conservative agenda of judges introducing heightened pleading. It seems to be a rather universal response, which fuels my thinking that this is a structural response more than an ideological response. We also have complexity with a simple ideological explanation for these kinds of reforms, because when you look at the cases, well, even in the summary judgment trilogy, Thurgood Marshall was in the majority of all three of the summary judgment trilogy cases. Berger joined Brennan's dissent in Celotex. Berger and Rehnquist dissented in Liberty Lobby. Justice Thomas and Justice Rehnquist wrote the unanimous opinions in Leatherman and Sverkovitz, which were responding to the early attempts to create some motion to dismiss pressures on plaintiffs. I'm suggesting that it may be enlightening to see these as anti-trial reforms rather than anti-plaintiff reforms. To be anti-trial certainly has anti-plaintiff effects, but given the structure of litigation, it's also hard to imagine anti-trial actions that have anti-defendant effects. In fact, my challenge is what is a pro-plaintiff anti-trial? So if we're assuming in 1985 that the word is trials, we can't really do trials anymore, but we need to cast a shadow, well, I'm suggesting that it's no surprise that, they, that district court judges, who couldn't rewrite the rules, they had to interpret the rules that they had, responded by, well, what's this thing, the motion to dismiss? Maybe we can dial that up a couple of notches. If instead they wanted to have an anti-trial but a pro-plaintiff reform, I want to hear what it is. I think it's interesting as an area of study to imagine what that would look like. Because notice that they couldn't have dialed the 12b6 down, for example. First of all, it was already down, plus that doesn't make trials less likely. Trials, if you're trying to get rid of trials, it's hard to find ways for plaintiffs to win at sooner points. It's just the structure of litigation. It has this gauntlet nature to it that makes it a structural challenge. And so I'm suggesting with my question here that this is an area where additional energy needs to be devoted. Because if this would be the way for us to test whether the ideological concern here is anti-plaintiff or anti-trial, well then let's think of a reform that would be anti-trial yet also pro-plaintiff. So I want some energy there in the next 30 years of my life. <laughs> and, and finally, 
I, it's an empirical question whether plaintiffs, in fact, still have the leverage of going to trial. We know that statistically it's not happening, but what I don't know is an empirical matter is, do they still have some leverage? Now, if they don't have any leverage, what that tells us then is motions to dismiss and motions for summary judgment need to, need to be revisited in light of the fact that these are terribly asymmetrical motions that essentially only benefit, I'm simplifying a little bit, but essentially only benefit defendants, and therefore it's a structure that doesn't, that it just basically isn't fair. That's the case if there is no leverage for plaintiffs to threaten such trial anymore. I'm suggesting that probably, I would think that that's not true. I think they still do have some leverage. It's now down 1% <laughs> empirically, but if you really, really wanted to go to trial, can you? Or is this judicial coercion of settlement so strong that it's not even an option? And to that, I want us to think about, or a question that I've been thinking about, is whether or not we as professors are arming our students with the confidence and the tools to resist judicial pressures to settle. If we really can survive 12 v6s, and it's only this coercion that is causing us to back away, if we can survive a 12 v6, if we could survive a motion for summary judgment, how do we not cow to that iron fist and our professors and his legal education generally contributing to that phenomenon? Are we teaching our students to be too deferential to judges? It's a hard question, because it's navigating something that could compromise your client if you get it wrong. But I think it is something for us to wonder about empirically whether or not there is, in fact, the, the, the possibility of trial that the plaintiffs can exploit uh, to restore this balance. So thank you very much. And even if they did, it's the same problem. I, I, I didn't want to. It's not. It, it's just. I mean, it's. It's not about who it is. It's about somebody's <laughs> right. the leverage. Yeah, the yeah. flips. Yeah, right. yeah, still, flips. yeah, yeah. Oh, that was great. That's, that's really interesting. I mean, yeah, that whole mythology. Think of how much that's driven. I know. It's driven a lot of stuff. <laughs> That's great. Uh, do you have a background in numbers crunch or stats or anything? This is not that. Yeah. This is just yes. plotting numbers. Uh, uh, it's time for a revolution here, Tom. Yeah. Well, and wow. hey, call on the okay. stage. Good morning. Yeah. Okay, everyone. Hello, hello. Time, time for talking among yourselves has expired. <laughs> um, I'm Don Dornberg because nobody else wants to be. Uh, <laughs> at the beginning, uh, I'd really like take. to thank uh, Mike Vitello for forcing us all to be here today. Uh, and a lot of the people who worked so hard to bring this uh, proceeding together, um, and that includes my colleague Mary Beth, um, and Mike, of course, and the law review students who contributed so much of their time and effort. Uh, Michael and, and Haley and Libby, um, and two staff members who did a lot of the legwork that's gone unmentioned, and that's Diana and Cassandra, um, who've done everything necessary to get all the people today, um, and really we all owe a lot of thanks to them. I think the next thing I should do is distinguish myself from Professor Mullenix. Um, she has the excuse of illness for her voice. Mine doesn't get any better than this. <laughs> and, and, you know, I'm sorry about that. But um, I'm here to talk a little bit about federal question jurisdiction, a topic of riveting importance to the public, as you can tell by its frequent appearance on the front pages of newspapers everywhere. Um, one of the problems in talking about federal question jurisdiction is a question from the beginning of the Republic that's gone pretty much unanswered. Um, and that is, what is the mission of the federal courts? That is to say, why is it that we want to have a federal court system at all? Because before 1789, we had state courts. We did OK with those. Um, what was the big deal about having federal courts? And unfortunately, there hasn't been any really coherent answer to that question beyond 
the really useless uh, sort of generalizations of, well, federal courts are there to decide questions of federal law. Uh, well, that doesn't get us very far down the yellow brick road of analysis, uh, because if you want to parallel that, then you end up saying, well, OK, and, and state courts uh, are there to um, answer questions of state law. Well, that's terrific. What about cases that have some of each in them? Are you going to adjudicate those in more than one forum um, at the same time? What are you going to do about mixed cases? Um, and that's the, the thing that we have not dealt with successfully for the couple hundred years that we've been at this project. Um, and the question really is, you know, what is it that should make a case eligible for federal judicial treatment as distinct from state judicial treatment. Now, you all know that there are areas where Congress has clearly said this gets federal judicial treatment. Right. Copyright, patent, areas of admiralty, areas of exclusive federal jurisdiction. <coughs> what we don't answer very coherently is why those areas? Why not other areas? You know, is it just because those are areas in which the states can't act? Well, there are lots of areas where the states can't act. Uh, the states can't act in any area that is secured by one of the provisions of the Constitution that's also applicable to the states. Not all of those cases go to the federal court. What is it that makes us want to expend federal time and money and effort on a particular kind of case? And there haven't been uh, very systematic, coherent answers to that. Um, and so that sort of shadows, to borrow from Tom May, that shadows the whole inquiry about federal question jurisdiction. Because if you're going to talk about subject matter jurisdiction uh, in general, or federal question jurisdiction in particular, um, you constantly come up against the question of why. You know, take any particular case you want. Why do you want this tried in a federal versus a state court, or a state versus a federal court? Um, now I can get rid of the easy stuff right away. Some years ago, I was a participant in a seminar of uh, teachers of the course in federal courts uh, that was chaired by uh, Professor Bert Newborn of NYU. Uh, and Bert, with all of these other federal court scholars around him, said, let's get rid of the easy questions first. Why do you want to be in federal court? The bathrooms are a lot cleaner. Um, you know, so, I mean, that's a reason uh, to, to be in the federal court. But otherwise, you know, why? Um, the second thing I want to introduce you to is a new term. Um, and it has to do with what I call the conflicts fallacy. Um, because you hear people discussing, um, there we go, what a great word. You hear people talking about cases being federal cases or state cases. And you know, in the late 18th century, and perhaps in, in part at least of the 19th century, that made some sense. Um, but today, it really doesn't. Because many cases, I dare say most cases, have questions in them that spring from more than one legal source, either multiple states or state federal sources or state federal or foreign sources. Um, and so to talk about a case as being a federal case or a state case really begs the question. And that brings us to this, this French word, dépassage, uh, which roughly translated means either something like dismemberment or butchering. Uh, take your pick. Uh, it's a phenomenon one sees in the law all the time. And you all saw it when you uh, studied diversity jurisdiction. You've done that, right? Um, diversity jurisdiction is a wonderful example of dépassage uh, because you learn that, yes, if the parties are diverse um, within the meaning of the complete diversity rule, um, even though the claim may be simply a claim involving state law, it can go to the federal court as long as there is enough in controversy. And always remember, you've got to have that extra penny. right? It's not $75,000. It's excess of $75,000. And if you're wondering what importance a single penny has today, that's what it is, right? I know some of us, you see a penny on the ground, you don't stop to pick it up. That could be the difference <laughs> between clean bathrooms and dirty ones. <laughs> so think about that. Um, but what we frequently have in cases, and certainly in diversity cases, is 
Federal law applies to some issues, and state law applies to other issues. Take the simplest example, right? A negligence case. It's a car crash, an intersection collision. But there are serious injuries or fatalities involved in lots of property damage, and the parties are from different states. And so they sue in the federal court, right? Well, there's very little question that with respect to the standard of conduct that establishes negligence, that law is going to come from the state. And even within the area of conflicts law, there's very little question that it's going to come from the state in which the collision occurred, right? After that, it gets more difficult. Because suppose, for example, one of the parties to the crash is an out-of-state charity. Uh, one of the things you find out in conflict of laws is that, well, yes, there are conduct governing rules, such as what was the speed limit um, at the site of the accident. Uh, but there are also loss allocation rules. Are charities exempt uh, from damages? And there are some cases, there's one very famous New York case, uh, where, yes, the, the accident happened in New York, and the court said that the conflict, uh, sorry, the conduct regulating rules were New York's. But because the charity was a New Jersey charity, and the other parties were from New Jersey, uh, the loss allocating rules came from New Jersey. Well, in diversity cases, and this is a terrible overgeneralization, right? The substantive law generally comes from the state law, and the procedural law generally comes from the federal rules of civil procedure, with which you've been laboring all semester. That's deposage. Right? That's deposage <coughs> happening. Um, when there are federal cases, for example, prototypical example is a federal civil rights case, right? a, a police beating case that goes into uh, the federal court because it's a Section 1983 civil rights case and it comes in under Sections 1331 and 1343, um, you know, well, that's fine. And federal law may apply to that, but how long do you have to bring such a case? Well, curiously, state law governs that. You're going to look to the law of the state in which the incident occurred to find out how long the plaintiff has to sue. That's deposage. All right? Ordinary car accident. Private parties involved. No charities. One state. All right? But nonetheless, there's a negligence case. Uh, and it's going to be filed in the state court because it can't go to the federal court. All right? Well, but part of what may establish negligence is the fact that the manufacturer of the vehicle failed to comply with one or more federal statutes mandating safety rules for automobiles. You know, that's deposage. And, it, and then the question in the background, of course, is should that kind of a case, if it's going to turn on a question of federal law, should it be heard in the federal court? And is that enough to get into the federal court? Um, and that's an important question. Before you say yes too rapidly, and I, I have to share with you, I'm a terrible federal court at least. Right? No, I'm, I'm the worst. I, I, when I was in practice, I swore I could frame a mortgage foreclosure case. For the federal case. <laughs> Some will say that's just because I'm obsessed with bathrooms. But I, mean, I don't listen to that sort of talk. Um, but... You know, the question is, where should the case be brought? Whose law is going to apply? And one of the things about deposage is it's sneaky. Because in the course of preparing um, this paper and this talk, I read an awful lot of congressional history. Um, I really did. And it's, it's everything you've been led to expect. <laughs> I needed that. <laughs> um, but very distinguished members of Congress, and there were some at one time, um, and some very distinguished federal judges who in fact know better, would talk about a case being a federal case or a state case. Um, and most of the time it doesn't make sense and it oversimplifies an incredibly complex issue. Because often there's many more than one jurisdiction's laws involved in a case. But now, let me get to the, the real meat of what I wanted to talk about. You've read some of the federal question jurisdiction cases, right? You read Motley, I'm pretty sure. Uh, you probably read Gable and Gunn, or Grable and Gunn, sorry. Um, I don't know if you read Merrill Dow, but that's one of the places where the trouble started. 
But you notice in Gregel and in Gunn, the court talks about this carefully calibrated balance of workload between the federal judiciary and the state judiciaries. Um, and I mean, there's some sense in talking about that because really what subject matter jurisdiction does is act as a switching system, directing cases either to the state courts or to the federal courts. Um, in the same way that personal jurisdiction largely acts as a switching mechanism, directing cases to one state's court or another state's court or another nation's um, courts. Uh, and the court constantly now, since 1986, talks about this carefully crafted congressional balance. And after reading uh, Merrill Dow in 1986 and uh, Grable and Gunn, I became really interested in this carefully uh, crafted congressional balance. So I went looking for it. <laughs> and I have read now, as far as I know, all of the congressional materials. Um, that includes floor debates, committee reports, committee hearings, Kleenex disposals, um, and other things from Congress for every single subject matter jurisdiction bill that was introduced from 19, well, really from 1875 on. And do you know that there is not a single bit of evidence of any carefully crafted congressional <laughs> balance with respect to federal question jurisdiction? All right, now they talk a lot about diversity jurisdiction. Right? Periodically, we have a, a diversity jurisdiction spasm, um, and people decide to take up again the question of, well, should we have diversity jurisdiction at all? And they talk endlessly about that. Um, and there are people on both sides, usually the predictable actors, you know, it's round up the usual suspects on both sides. Um, and there's a, there's a difference of opinion. And you notice what Congress has done over the years, by the way. It's very entertaining to me. Because lots of people are saying we shouldn't have diversity. It's too expensive. And Congress responds to that. They, they won't get rid of diversity because trial lawyers make too many contributions to congressional campaigns. <laughs> Um, but what they do is periodically they raise the necessary amount of controversy. It began at $500 back in the 18th century and progressively went to 2000 3000 10000 50000 and today it's at 75000 Stay tuned for six figures, um, but don't stay tuned for the demise of diversity jurisdiction because I just don't think it's going to happen. Um, but that's what they talk about. The only discussion I've been able to find in Congress of federal question jurisdiction cases and which, which disputes we should regard as federal question cases and which ones we should not is very briefly around 1980, um, the year really before 1980, because the federal question jurisdiction statute that you see today, 1331, has no monetary component to it. Until 1980, it did. It had a monetary floor that tracked the diversity floor. Um, and finally, in 1980, Congress decided to get rid of that. Um, and there was some discussion of that. The big discussion in Congress, um, not just so much on that as on diversity, is what will it do to the docket? How many cases will it bring into the federal courts? And this gets back to something that Tom was, was talking about. Yes, there's been an explosion of litigation. Um, and the courts certainly are, have gotten, and this is irrespective of your political point of view, the courts have gotten pretty frantic in trying to figure out ways to deal with this explosion um, of litigation. And that's what Congress talks about. Uh, one of the things that persuaded Congress to withdraw the floor from federal question jurisdiction was that they had lots and lots of people saying to them, you're not talking about very many cases at all. Um, and you're really not. You know, you're really not. It would have, it had um, almost no noticeable effect on the federal docket. Diversity, of course, does. Diversity supplies about a quarter of the cases uh, on the federal docket, and that has for many, many years. Um, the other thing the court's done in the area of subject matter jurisdiction. Well, I'm sorry, before I go to that, let me mention to you that with all this talk about carefully calibrated balance, you would expect to find some citation, right, to Congress, or at least a member of Congress, or at least the Capitol Dome. <laughs> Nothing. 
The court's cases, when it talks about the carefully calibrated balance, cite other of its cases. <laughs> and those cases cite other of the court's cases. But none of them, right? Going back even to Moses versus Pharaoh, none of them <laughs> cite any congressional materials at all. Right? Think how well you would do in the Supreme Court if the judge said to you, well, have you any support for your position, counselor? And you, you said, yes, Your Honor, I said the same thing only three weeks ago. <laughs> and before that, I had said it when I was in high school. <laughs> and I was a really precocious baby, because I didn't have any of this mama, dada shit. The first thing out of my mouth was federal question jurisdiction. <laughs> you know? Um, <laughs> And, I mean, there's nothing there. One other thing I wanted to bring to your attention before I, I sort of close up, um, and that is, I mean, as of 1936, the story on federal question jurisdiction was fairly well settled, all right? You had to have a federal issue that was well pleaded within the meaning of Motley. It had to be outcome determinative, which doesn't add anything to its being well pleaded. I mean, the fact that it's well pleaded means it is outcome determinative. Why do we know that? Because if you take it out of the complaint, the complaint dies. Right? That's the best test for whether something is well pleaded. Um, and there was this idea that, yes, the judiciary would distinguish among cases that were worth having and not worth having. Um, and that came from Justice Cardozo in 1936. But basically, the test was fairly well settled. Um, after that, the court started referring again to congressional intent. Uh, Justice Frankfurter did it in the Skelly Oil case, which mercifully he didn't read. Um, if you'd like to be really upset and confused, go read Skelly Oil. Um, I don't suggest it. Uh, where he cited congressional intent um, and relied on it quite explicitly, not citing it. And by the way, got it wrong, uh, because there's plenty of evidence that congressional intent was the other way. Um, the, in 1986, we get this idea of carefully calibrated balance, or substantiality, which is what Justice Stevens called it um, in Merrill Dow. And you read about substantiality in Grable and in Gunn. Do you understand what it is? Good, because I'd hate to be alone <laughs> in this. But let's assume for just a moment that there is a carefully crafted congressional balance for distribution of cases between the federal and the state courts. Well, if you think of it, if you stipulate that that exists, how do you explain, explain cases like Twombly and Iqbal? Because they must have knocked that balance into a cocked hat. Because without question, they are keeping out of the federal courts, and therefore sending to the state courts, an awful lot of cases that otherwise would have come in. Right? Merrill Dow, which was, by the way, a drug uh, case, uh, dealing with uh, uh, birth defects in, in infants. Um, Merrill Dow is one of the cases that the court cited as not being very substantial um, for federal question purposes because it would have brought a lot more cases into the federal courts. Uh, well, I have bad news for the court. It really wouldn't. And for this reason, you don't have to regard the drug cases as federal question cases, although it's certainly reason to do so with the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. But the fact is, as you all know, there are relatively few major pharma companies. They're concentrated in relatively few states or foreign nations. Almost all of the cases that arise through misbranding or deleterious drugs would qualify as diversity cases anyway. So you're really not talking about any significant increase in the federal docket. Uh, by regarding those as federal question cases. The question is, what do you do in a federal question jurisdiction? And that gets back to the thing I began with, right? Why is it that we want cases in the federal courts um, in the first place? Well, I don't know that we'll get an answer to that. I'm pretty sure we won't get an answer to it in my lifetime. But I want to uh, relate to one other line of cases that you haven't come to yet, um, but you're going to in the next probably week or so um, and that's the line of cases named after Professor Vitello's wife, Erie, um, 
And it was very, the fight that led up to Erie was very interesting. I'm not going to go through it here. Uh, but one of the most influential opinions that preceded Erie uh, was written by Oliver Wendell Holmes in dissent, um, who talked about the federal courts uh, then licensed to make general federal law. Um, and referred to it as an unconstitutional assumption of powers uh, that no lapse of time or weight of history should make us hesitate to correct. Well, I want to suggest to you that what's going on in the area of federal question jurisdiction with substantiality is that the court is making a substantial common law, that is judge-made law, of what's substantial and what's not. Now, I'm not opposed to federal common law. Um, there are areas in which it does exist and which I think should exist. The, the easiest example is Title IX of, of the uh, education uh, amendments, right? equal, op equal opportunity by gender um, in education. Terrific. That title doesn't con contain an explicit private right of action. There's no place where that title says uh, persons aggrieved by violations of this statute may sue. The court in 1979 implied a federal right of action. Um, and I don't have a problem with that because the congressional policy was clearly expressed in Title IX. Um, indeed, there was more because some years before this case, uh, Congress, although it didn't change Title IX, had amended Section 1988, which provides for attorney's fees for prevailing uh, plaintiffs in civil rights cases, um, and allowed attorney's fees in Title IX cases. Uh, but what I want to suggest to you is what the court is doing here is making federal law without a guiding congressional policy, and they're blaming it on Congress. That's why they keep talking about carefully calibrated congressional balance. You know, why do people do that? Psychiatrists call it projection, right? You attribute to somebody else something that makes you feel bad or guilty. Um, and the court's going off on its own here. And it ought to feel bad or guilty. And the result of it is closing the courthouse doors. Thank you very much. OK, um, so <laughs> Dean Calatrala is coming down. And he's going to say a few words. Then I think what we should do, I, I would like to have our our panelists be able to take some questions, but I also think the lunch may be getting yucky out there. So Hi. we'll we'll do this. We'll have Dean Colatella say a few words, then we will um, go out and get lunches. And if you have questions, come back in. Are you guys willing to take a few sure. Sure. with your lunch in hand? Sure. We'll sure. let you eat lunch first. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Sure. Well, thank you, everybody. I've been asked to just say a few things, and I'll be brief. I, my, my primary job is actually to thank everyone for being here. Thank you for being here. Again, even if you two are compelled to be here, um, get used to it. Once you're lawyers, the judges will compel you to do lots of things. Uh, but let me just start by saying to thank the, the Law Review Board for organizing this. I thank Professor Mike Vitello for writing the book. animating civil procedure that's inspired this uh, symposium. Uh, Professor Jay Moods, uh, Professor uh, Don Dorenberg, Professor Tom Main, our former colleague and still friend, mm -hmm. Professor Linda Mullix, Mullenix, uh, Professor Richard Freer. To have uh, the, uh, uh, these authors here um, is just really the, who have your, your primary textbooks for both classes is, I think, really uh, quite amazing. Uh, then also the staff, um, yeah. Cassandra Fernandez and Diana Martinez, who helped all this, and of course, last but not least, uh, Professor, actually Dean, I keep uh, saying this, uh, Dean Mary Beth Moylan, who uh, helped uh, organize much of it. <laughs> uh, so just to, I mean, to have the opportunity to have these scholars here, these teachers and scholars, to have this wide-ranging discussion of civil procedure, and I know because you're just really I I into the middle of this course that some of it may not, I mean, some of it, I was a civil litigator, and some of it I'm like thinking, oh my God, is that right? Is that, I mean, just all these things you learn, and some of it may not have been 
uh, completely understandable to you, but I, what I hope is that it helps you to raise some questions about the importance of civil procedure. So one of the things that Professor Molinix talked about was that procedure is important. It's often forgotten. It doesn't get a lot of press when you read um, the newspaper articles about law, and maybe a third or 40 percent of uh, the newspaper every day is about some legal issue. Procedure doesn't get a lot of press, but those of us who are lawyers, and certainly those of us who practice civil, civil litigation, understand it's important. Cases are won or lost based on your knowledge of civil procedure. And so um, this is a time to sort of get that. And it's not just the federal court civil procedure, it's the state court civil procedure. And the, and the laws, as, as Professor Dornberg said, it's not state or federal cases. These cases often have all of it in one. Um, and so the idea, one of the things that law school, I think, could do better job of is the idea of strategy in litigation. And so one of the things that civil procedure does help you with is, you know, when do you file your motions? And what kinds of motions do you file? And what kind of discovery do you, do you ask for? I mean, this is something that um, if you start to learn the civil procedure as well, like any game, right, the rules matter and how you use the rules and a litigator's understanding, deep understanding of the rules is important. And this brings me to another sense of why these discussions are so important for you, because you as lawyers will have a lot of influence over what those rules are. There's not just committees that you can serve on as lawyers to help shape what those rules will be. All of the cases that you talked about, or that you heard about today, were litigated by lawyers. And so those arguments that were adopted in these famous cases were to a great extent argued by lawyers and were then adopted by the judges. And I'm not suggesting that the judges didn't often come up with their own ideas, but most of the time those ideas came from the legal briefs that were written by lawyers. And so your ability to change what the law is, is not just through these committees, which are important, it's also through good lawyering. And so that's another piece of things that as lawyers, we actually control the procedure that we end up having to live with. Amen. And so it's something to keep uh, in mind. Um, I learned a few things today. Um, uh, Depecage, is that the right term? Depecage. I didn't learn it well enough. Apparently, <laughs> Depecage. Um, and the idea uh, that Professor Vitello as the Grim Reaper is something I think might keep me up tonight. Um, and so you might want to uh, keep, think about that. Um, and just the statistics, and too, keeping up with the work that Professor Maine talked about, really understanding that sometimes the view and cry of things isn't always the truth. And so to keep in mind about what is, as lawyers, actually happening with the civil litigation system, um, and knowing that there are a lot, not even here, there was, no, wasn't always agreement about what was happening. And so uh, my hope for you is you understand the importance of this particular topic, uh, your ability to influence this particular topic, and to ask the right questions when dealing with these kinds of laws. So in that, thank you, and I'll have you go to lunch. Yay. OK, so I know that some people have questions. So if we can kind of be eating our lunch and talking at the same time, I think that that would work well. And I'll um, encourage people to eat their lunch while we ask questions. And I know a lot of you have questions that other people might have the same questions. So. And we're getting signatures and things because Rich is famous. <laughs> deserved. Uh, mostly. <laughs> mostly deserved. So I know, where did she go? I know Kylie had a question. But oh, she, where did she go? Oh, she's over there. Kylie, you have a question. You don't have it yet? You don't want to be the first one? Okay. <laughs> I have questions if no one else does, but I, do I too. You have, okay, good. Linda has a question. Linda will go first. Uh oh, I'm in trouble. Yes, <laughs> yes, Professor Mullen. What did I get wrong? Yep. Okay. <laughs> so, um, what about the case? Oh, yeah. Okay. Let me put my lunch over here. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Right? Um, and you can, <clears throat> you can fit them in the framework of closing the courthouse doors, denial of access to justice. Sure. You haven't heard my question yet. Okay, gotcha. Okay. <laughs> um, 
So I look at those four cases. I'm playing devil's advocate. All right. And one of my responses, uh, okay, and the reason why my response is uh, I don't have a problem with the size, right? That two foreign corporations have to be done. So, right. And so the question is, why should we be upset about that, right? Yep. Well, no, oh, come on, let me check. Uh, McIntyre. Right. Yes. Okay, what is it, McIntyre, and I'm not afraid to use, kind of a procedural unicorn? that can be cabined kind of to its peculiar facts. Mm -hmm. So part of the, you know, it, by the way, these cases are all terrible on the underlying facts. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. Um, but, you know, the, the big um, hypothetical fear there was that corporate defendants were not going to change their behavior and, you know, funnel all of their products through a distributor to bring themselves to the next guy. You know, it's like, well... You know, is that really going to happen? And then Daimler. Yeah. Okay, Daimler, yeah, yeah. They lose the FQ case. Right. Okay. And yes, it's horrible. It happened to all the Argentines in Argentina. Okay. Um, and so it does raise this profound question, which is should American courts be open? Right. And, and, the, and what comes under, you know, that particular, all these human rights cases right. were coming in under Alien Tort Claims Statute. And, True. Uh, and terrorism. Well, can I jump on that one? Because it was really four. Yeah, four. <laughs> but they all, I think, well, I mean, if you can put them into a box, you, the box we're dealing with now is kind of dealing with foreign litigation. Well, let me, can I, let me, here's my problem with those cases. I, I agree. I think the Supreme Court, I know the Supreme Court has to take cases as they come to the court. I get that. But they have been singularly bad in selecting cases because Asahi and, uh, and, and Daimler when you boil them down, are really form non-convenience cases. And they should have been dismissed under form non-convenience. I realized as it was filed, I agree with you, we've talked about this, that as it was filed with Zercher in there, it was not form non. But once it got to the court, it was the plaintiff was out of there. It was form, it was FQ. And it seems to me that you ding that on form non-convenience grounds and you do not name the jurisdiction. And, and so I think those were just really sloppy cases, and, and they're just unfortunate that they were there. I would much rather have had them rule on that basis. Like, going back to Hanson, Hanson could have been ruled on on necessary parties. Right, okay, but, but having, you know, yeah. bad, bad cases make bad law. Yeah. Okay, but what happens is then they're translated as part of this narrative. Sure. Okay, so that's, that's kind of the thing. Okay. And by the way, I, you know, the What's personal jurisdiction and jurisprudence totally drives me nuts because I think it's getting more and more incoherent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? Well, so the doctrine and it's even more trying to get to speak. I, I agree. Linda, can I jump in for a second? Yeah. Sure. So the problem I see, first of all, with the O'Connor approach and Asahi, Kennedy approach and Castro, is that when you heighten that standard of purposeful availability, you really are moving away. You know, in my book, I say McGee is the only only coherent mm -hmm. that ever written on personal jurisdiction. But when I'm watching how that would narrow specific jurisdiction so much, and then to watch the narrowing of general jurisdiction, it is really making it a much more difficult job for the plaintiffs at this very moment where international and interstate transactions are increasing. And then there's something, and I don't I haven't done the research yet, maybe and the other panelists, Rich, you may know this. If I were <clears throat> part of pro-defense groups, I would be pressuring states to limit the statutes that require the appointment of an agent mm. for all purposes. And I don't know whether that's happening yet. <clears throat> so even there, you're getting... You know, Rich and I have talked about the Ferens case and why John Deere... Right. I love to tell my students that when I lived in Mississippi, in a little county, there were more pieces of John Deere equipment than there were people, which was literally true. And I, we don't know whether 
Aaron's was a case where John Deere just didn't think it could object based on general jurisdiction, or it was a case where there was a statute that required it to appoint an agent. But, I mean, again, once you're narrowing general jurisdiction so much and you're giving business organizations an opportunity to change legislation to make it even more difficult, and making general jurisdiction, specific jurisdiction more difficult, then you're really arguing with your case. Just on top of that, notice how many cases were just assumed to be general jurisdiction in Goodyear. Goodyear USA was subject to general jurisdiction in North Carolina. Go ahead. All right. I absolutely do not understand what's going on with the state of Ginsburg in this case and what her project is. And what's really bewildering is she's the liberal on the court. What is she doing? And, you know, you said you are eviscerating general jurisdiction. I read, at least in two of these cases, she said, well, if you look over all of the jurisprudence coming out of the court and all the personal jurisdiction, there were only two cases that had ever been decided on the basis of assertion of general jurisdiction. And I read that, and she said, everything else is an illustration of specific jurisdiction. And I was sitting there as a procedure teacher, and I was like, what is she talking about? So what is going on? I don't have a clue. Arthur Miller has an article that just came out, and he has a footnote. He says, I went to law school with Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and I would have thought it's impossible that this kind of decision was in her DNA, that it just, you know. But I think we also see, I just can't, there are these bad cases where courts have overreached, and that's why the Supreme Court ends up having to take a case. Daimler and the Ninth Circuit vastly overreached. The North Carolina Court of Appeals in Goodyear vastly overreached. They based general jurisdiction on stream of commerce, which nobody had ever done. And so you're going to get a court reaction to that. The Supreme Court's going to take them. But I don't know. I don't know why she feels the need to do this. She is constitutionalized. Leah Brillmeier is really what it boils down to. It's the at-home thing. Yeah, no. And even there, why is, I get why there are corporations at home where it's incorporated. That's the state that gives it its being. But if you're going to base another state for general jurisdiction, why is it where the headquarters is? It would seem to me it would be activities-based. It would be where the muscle center is, because that's where you interact with the cancer. And it's crucial it's decided the same year. Well, that's the problem. But personally. We've been having this conversation about being at home, and it just got me. Yeah, but personal jurisdiction, those are different things. Why are we taking a statutory concept from subject matter and sticking it in due process? I don't get that. I have a question about the language she uses, because it would have been easy for her to say, look, the two diversity bases are also the bases for general jurisdiction. Whether it's wise or not is something else. But she hasn't said that in two cases. She said, essentially at home, such as. And if you visualize the diversity bases as intersecting circles, if you will, covering a certain area, she's not saying we're limited to that area. She's saying there's some area outside of that that constitutes essentially at home, but not really at home. What is she doing with that? I don't think Perkins is. Does anybody read a third possibility? I agree with Sotomayor in the BNSF case that you really have ruled out a third state, because Perkins is sui generis. So Perkins is OK during the war. It was its principal place of business. Absolutely. That's exactly right. It could be Boeing in Washington. Yeah. I mean, that's about as extreme a hypo as you could come up with. You also get the discussion in Hearns from what Breyer's suggestion that there may be a drop box that they claim to be the principal place of business. Maybe in that kind of circumstance. The only two cases that started on the basis of general jurisdiction were international issues and Perkins. That's it. Is that right? No. You know, Mary Twitchell did a great article back in the 80s called The Myth of General Jurisdiction. And what she showed was that cases that call themselves general jurisdiction, there really was some relationship between the claim and the activities in the forum. 
But what in I just... Shoe, there certainly was. There certainly was in Shu, but what <coughs> I, I just think when you cut back on general jurisdiction, it's Bristol-Myers Squibb, it seems to me, should have been subject to general jurisdiction here. They're identical pills. In the context here in California, I don't think you should have general jurisdiction in all 50 states, but I do think with the context there, they would have been, BMS would have been seen as an insider in California. And there's no inconvenience. They have lawyers all over the place in the state. There's no no particular harm to them, but, but that's all gone. Well, the other thing, too, about the general jurisdiction cases, there's never been an explanation, maybe first, why? the case jurisdiction by necessity, but yeah. the yeah. court has never explained right. why general jurisdiction, why it's closing it down. And if they had a coherent theory, then maybe the rules themselves that emerge would be more sensible. Right. For example, again, if you go back to my premise that the only time the court ever got it right was McGee, the wonderful moment in uh, Bristol Myers was when the attorney admits an oral argument, oh, it wouldn't be in inconvenient here. Mm -hmm. My God, in fact, probably it's a whole lot more convenient because they already have the lawsuit with mm -hmm. all the all California. The California yeah. uh, after we do McGee, I start putting um, a, a, like a continuum line <coughs> on the blackboard, and by then they're very familiar, they're very international, and it's where you place these, mm -hmm. all right? Yeah. And he's always out there, okay, as the big outlier, and that's when the court started coming back. Mm -hmm. You know, of course, Hanson would, you know, as you and I agree, King was here. Mm -hmm. but, no. but Hanson was um, better than giving positive propositions about. Basis for a search for personal jurisdiction. In that case, it's giving negative. They're, they're just giving arguments you can't use. Right. Yeah, I, I have something perhaps for the students to ponder, um, and that is with the, the cutback we're seeing in general jurisdiction with respect to corporations, and I think it, it's clear that we are, whether it's a good idea or not is different. Um, consider what the court has done in the area of, of personal and uh, general jurisdiction for individuals, because mm -hmm. Um, if I spend 10 minutes over the board in Nevada, over the border in Nevada, I can be served with process from a Nevada court, which then has access to adjudicate essentially my entire life, even if that's the only time I went to Nevada. Whereas a corporation that may be doing millions of dollars of annual business in Nevada right, may not be subject to general jurisdiction. I mean, I think you could take either of those positions. I'm not quite sure how you get both of those within the same consciousness. Mm -hmm. One other thing you should add into the mix. Prior to Schaefer, VMS would have been subject to jurisdiction in REM mm -hmm. in California because of its labs, millions of dollars, presumably. Maybe it would have fulfilled an entire judgment. I don't know how much. Mm -hmm. But it sounds like there's an enormous amount of activity going on. And of course, I doubt that any member any members of the court are rethinking in REM jurisdiction. Justice Scalia never, I mean, in Burnham, he uses the word traditional or tradition 32 yeah, times. And I don't see him willing to. He's poking to... fun at Brandon. Hmm? In doing that, he's poking fun at Brandon. Oh, I know. So yeah. that's what that's all about. Yeah. But, Don, I mean, I, I read Burnham a little bit differently. I, I just, Burnham, there is no. Because the Brennan, under the Brennan approach in Burnham, you could make a challenge that your presence was there so transient under the restatement approach. Maybe, you know, I give my students the example where you're driving through uh, Oklahoma for five minutes, you make a rest stop, the wee wee, and then uh, you're served with process. And for Brennan, I think it might be, and of course, Justice uh, uh, Stevens says, and throws up his hands, the worst opinion ever. He says, I'm not going to play the game that you assholes are. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, uh, so I, I'm not as sure as you are that you'd be subject to it. But, and then, by the well, way, I did some research after Burnham to see whether the lower courts were actually cons adding, doing the right number. Those cases don't exist in the real world, five minutes in a jurisdiction. The ones where you're there very impermanently are really voluntary in this case yeah. if you were tricked into the jurisdiction. Well, what, what we learn about Justice Stevens, I think, from cases like Burnham and like Asahi, is we know what his uh, kindergarten report card read. Um, he does not work or play well with others. Right, right. But he does try to avoid conflict. Yes. So, somebody su suggested that the reason the court stopped doing it, yeah. 
until 2011 was to let him retire. They just weren't going to go there. After, after Asahi and Burnham, they said, no, we can't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 that's, that's, yeah. So it's your speculation. Well, it, yeah. <laughs> Probably wouldn't be. But yeah, we kicked it around a lot. That's what we figured. See, I only give guys, you're the only one I really know. <laughs> so we, yeah, we, 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 we did kick that one around. Do, so. do any of the students have any questions? I know, right? These guys will just go. Nah. Wind up and... <laughs> have fun. This is nice. All right. They're, enjo they're just enjoying the... Yes, yes. Professor Landsberg has a question. So, I am always a student. You have, the question you asked, why, why do we have federal courts? And, you know, I always sort of understood they were there to protect federal rights. That's a special need for federal courts. And I, I know one of this has written about that. And uh, ties in with Tom's charts that show the prevalence of settlements. And I think this wrote uh, against settlements. Wondering whether this, whether the settlements are consistent with that purpose of federal courts. Well, I mean, Brian, I wasn't suggesting that it's not possible to elucidate a coherent theory of why we have federal courts. What I am suggesting is the courts haven't done it, um, and you know, if you want to say, all right, it's to protect federal rights, I mean, then you have some problems with the court's current cases. Uh, because then, in Merrill Dow, the case ought to stay in, uh, <coughs> because they were claiming rights under the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act of 1938. Um, and, you know, I suppose under uh, that test, Grable against DeRue ought to stay in also uh, for a similar reason. Um, although what struck me as, as fascinating about that opinion is just a suitor writes that part of the reason it's a substantial federal question is because the cases won't arise very often. And to me, that's horrendously counterintuitive. I should think the cases that you would want federal adjudication on are the ones that most often present um, thorny issues of federal law, not the ones that are likely to do it the least. And I understand his concern was with docket congestion. Um, on the other hand, as, as uh, um, I think it was Justice Harlan said in, in the Bivens case, you know, there, there are better ways to deal with unmeritorious cases than by throwing out meritorious ones. By the way, one thing, Mary Beth, I think that students may enjoy in this interaction is that law professors disagree mm -hmm. exactly on some of these questions mm -hmm. because when I go into class and tell them, you know, where the line is is uncertain. And I think I'm just withholding my problem. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. then they realize it really is. I, I love to tell them about the, the listserv debate about some of these cases. And uh, I think it's great for them yeah. to see Linda telling, uh, you know, recasting me and Mr. Green Weaver. Yeah. Okay. So in um, McIntyre, in the first part of that, um, Scalia goes to pick a look, but it's the ghost of the lawyer. It's a really strange riff on state sovereignty. Right. Well, and yeah. So, um, as far as I can tell, post McIntyre, that has not gotten any traction anywhere. But with the um, change in the federal judiciary, okay, um, you know, is, is it likely that we're going to see that particular theory gaining more well, traction? Yeah. BMS refers to it. BMS does refer to it, and you get eight justices signing that. And as I understood it, when, when White broke it down in, in worldwide, contact requirement is there to protect your state federalism. Fairness is there to protect liberty interest of the defendant. Then two years later, we said, oh, sorry, sorry, there is no, yeah, that's right, there is no interstate federalism. But the, the requirement is obviously still there. But I read, yeah, I read yeah. Bristol Myers to say, yeah, contact means this territoriality. And Mike's written about that. Yeah, that's the paper I wrote. So what do you th and don't you think it's contact based? It makes contact yeah. even stronger. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it is. It's really strange. And Ginsburg signed that opinion. Yeah. And there's a young federal, there's a young federalist scholar who has written um, a paper that I address in the, in the piece I did for the symposium, and he's trying to justify 
finding sovereignty uh, as part of the due process analysis. And, and to me, it's, it's insane. Uh, it, it, as the mea culpa of the white came up with, and I just can't find any coherent uh, role for sovereignty. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I can wait. The first resurfaces in World War Volkswagen, <laughs> where the point says there's two different concerns. Right. <laughs> and when I do it with my students, you know, I'm, I have them focus because they just, they don't read anything carefully. And when I point that out to them, I say, where is that coming from? Mm -hmm. And then finally the light bulb goes on. And that's the first ghost of the noise. Yeah. And then yeah. McIntyre, it yeah. comes out really strong. Mm -hmm. And it's like, why are they pushing this? When you, you know, Kennedy's opinion in McIntyre really does. Read like Benoit yeah. says, well, you got domicile and you got service of process on the farm and you got consent. Then there's just the international shoe business. But, <laughs> yeah. but why are they pushing that theory? Shrink, Limiting shrink, the. Shrink, shrink jurisdiction. But I just find it interesting that, you know, the more I've taught this, the more I think the Burger King is a real problem. And Burger King creates this presumption that once you find contact, mm -hmm. the defendant has this rather daunting burden mm -hmm. to show that it's not uh, reasonable under the facts, very hard to do. And that was Brennan's, I have a theory on this, it was the only time Brennan got a majority opinion in personal jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. He wrote more personal jurisdiction opinions than any other justice. Well, he didn't want to do that because he wanted to push his theory of specific Exactly right. And he and had one this. One year later, and he yeah. just seized on any case. That's right. And that's what he wanted to yeah. do there. But Burkett is also bizarre on the facts, right? That somehow or other it would be reasonable um, uh, for uh, Rutledge and uh, what is the name of the Rutledge and Shah Rutledge and Shah But they're being told that it would have been reasonable for them to foresee that they're going to have to defend in Florida because of a choice of law provision <laughs> in the contract, right. right? And then I ask the students, you know, if you First of all, nobody reads that copy, you know, right? mm -hmm. but could you reasonably conclude, not from a choice of forum, but forum, yeah. a choice of law. Yeah. Well, I think one could almost argue it the other way. The fact that there's a choice of, of law clause in the contract suggests that at least Burger King was well aware that they might be litigating in forums other than Florida um, and wanted to make sure it was always going to get its own law. But I, I wanted to mention also one of the, the wonderful ironies I saw in the Castro uh, which is Justice Kennedy starts out by reciting the uncertainty that Asahi has created. And he says, now we're going to, yeah, to right. bring greater certainty <laughs> in the year. And, he, and he's writing a plurality opinion. Yeah. <laughs> and there are even more. Well, Mr. Nicastro's <laughs> dilemma now, you think about Mr. Nicastro, he can't sue in New Jersey because there's no contact, so there's no specific jurisdiction. Ohio, there's no general jurisdiction now under the new era. But I think under Bristol Myers, there would have been specific jurisdiction in Ohio because that machine was shipped through Ohio and touched Ohio in some way. I don't know. But it touched New Jersey in the same way. Well, it did. It did. And the, and well, course, it UK. Some right. Of the some hyper right. Stopped. But that's forum non. That's right. It's forum non, and it was not an American plaintiff. Now we're doing it to an American plaintiff maimed in his home state just going to work. I mean, but it, it's it, a weird case because, I mean, it's the distributor's bankruptcy that yeah. creates the whole problem. Right. That's the whole, you know, and that happens all the time. You can't bring a suit because, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, the defendant you want to sue is insolvent. Right. But what about the fact that there may have been bad laws? Well, put it this way. When you read certainly parts of Breyer's concurring opinion, there's a suggestion of bad lawyer. True, false. In other words, should the plaintiff's lawyer have really said, I've got to get more discovery? I don't know what. Yeah. yeah. I think you're right. I think that's yeah. true. What, what, I think that's true. don't know how vigorous the discovery yeah. principles would have been in the pretrial yeah. stage. Georgetown yeah. has this great institute, Supreme Court stuff, where they. Did they, you do a mock they mo yeah, so yeah. Wendy and I did a mock <laughs> for them. It was the week before the argument. And we pressed the plaintiff's counsel, but what does the record show? Yeah. yeah. The record was really not very clear. I don't think this guy had, had been at the trial court. But anyway, it was just, maybe there was one machine, maybe there were four machines. Nobody said, yeah, but where's the advertising? Where's the, where's the, 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 right. you know, so right. the Ginsburg right. dissent, right. she's got tons of facts in there. Yeah. That's true. And so, and my, my question is, where did she get the facts? She went online and found <laughs> <laughs> No, usually, you know, you're not supposed to right. go outside the record. Yeah. On the so record. maybe there was a, a bigger record in the majority well, and just ignored it. Yeah. 
morality in the beginning that just got like three facts yeah. of yeah. three countries. Yeah. 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 You don't even know what and, happened. Right. You know what right. I mean? And then you get to the dissent by Ginsburg, and it's like, well, there's got tons of facts. Yeah. Right. And then you get Breyer. I think that Breyer opinion is remarkable because he's just saying, I'm not taking a position here. I mean, he goes out of his way to say, you can't paint me into a corner. But it, yeah, it's just, it's mm -hmm. just. It is kind of goofy, but and, but he says no. There's never been a case with jurisdiction based on one contact. Well, McGee is arguably McGee, that. Yeah. Hess versus Hess. Pulaski is a you know. In fact, if one of my students said that, I would give them a C. <laughs> <laughs> They're taking notes. <laughs> All right. One other thing, Rich, about Burger King, though. What about the statement? And I always thought that this was sort of a stealth statement. Yeah. By to compensate. Burger. That they will well when it, it, on a lesser show, yes, right? It, yes, then the, the, the balance because he this, doesn't win in, right. in mm -hmm. uh, worldwide Volkswagen, so he's bringing it in by way of dicta. This, this is, and, and so that would be yeah. the one thing where, uh, and then of course, he cites uh, Coleman, uh, <laughs> right. This is, this is my, my theory on that case is he finally got a majority opinion. He says, Okay, I'll play ball with you, I'll do the two step, but he slips in there. What Howard Stravitz in South Carolina calls a linked, a forced linkage, because there's no case under his sliding scale idea where you don't have to look at, at the fairness factor. So, mm -hmm. gee, we can uphold jurisdiction if the reasonableness is really high. We can do it on a lesser yeah. basis of yeah. contact. But it, nobody's ever mentioned that since yeah. then. So he took a gamble, I think, on, okay, yeah. they're going to... But they did. They never. And if the Castro wasn't that case, then we can right. assume it's right. exactly right. I mean, you talk about a case where okay, let's give you let's give you yeah. contact. Yeah, contact. that's a yeah. really good point. Yeah, and the Castro is that case. Interesting. Yeah. All right. Any other questions? Can I just ask a clarifying question on that last point? That it's I didn't quite follow. So it's on DK and there was, was the well Burger. Is yeah, Brennan wrote Burger King. He, he he had descended and descended and descended. He was a disciple of, of Hugo Black on this stuff because he was a melange guy. He says, just throw it all in there, throw it all in there. And the problem today is trying to get access to the what I call the fairness factors or the reasonableness factors, whatever you want to call them. Because often what the court's forgotten is that fairness factors can support jurisdiction. All this court looks for is for fairness factors to defeat jurisdiction. And so Brennan said, well, tell you what, we, will, we ought to look at the fairness factors in every case, and if they're really strong, they should support jurisdiction on a lesser showing of contact. So he would have that wall down here. Let's look at fairness, and maybe, maybe the wall can stay down there. The problem is the wall is pretty high. <laughs> look for the word compensate. That's what yeah. it is in the opinion. Compensate for weak, weaker minimum contact. Yeah, yeah. exactly. But, but black, you know, black from the beginning, it was just, you just throw them all into a mix. Yeah, yeah. And then it becomes, then we separate them out, and then one becomes much more important. So it's all about the defendant. Yeah. <laughs> it just is. It's all about the defendant instead of the state's interest well, yeah. or the plaintiff's interest. And that's Thomas mm -hmm. over and over, right? Mm -hmm. The defendant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, they, oh. but the lips, I mean, I know. it is they're interesting. Not, I know, <laughs> they're, they're not them or... Mm -hmm. Really doing it. Okay, anybody else? No? Questions? Questions? Thank you all very much we for coming. We applaud you for being Thank here on a Friday. That's great. <laughs>